collaborate, stop, collaborate and listen. Parks is back with an old invention. Whenever your pet goes number two, it's your job to scoop the poop. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't think so. Poop shouldn't be left to decompose. To the extreme, back it up like a champ. Throw it away, you did your part, get amp. Damn! Rush your baggie to the trash. Keep the water clean, do your part in a flash. Deadly. One bacteria goes steadily. Anything less than scooping is a felony. Love it or leave it, you better gang way. You better hit the bullseye, the dogs don't play. This can be a problem, but yo, we'll solve it. Check out the hook while my DJ revolves it. Don't forget to scoop. Yo, man, let's get out of here. Word to your pupper. Day, January 24th, 2023. It is 6 p.m. We are in city chambers, and I call the city commission regular meeting to order. Commissioners present are Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner Stokes, myself, Mayor Langdon, Vice Mayor White, and Commissioner Emrich, there is a quorum for this meeting. Also present are City Manager Fletcher, City Attorney Slayton, City Clerk Faust, Recording Secretary Powell, Deputy Chief Morales, and Fire Chief Titus up in the back. Um, Joan Morgan, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I request a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Oh, I have a tie there. I'll go with Commissioner McDowell. Um, so we have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell to approve the agenda as presented, seconded by Commissioner Emrich. <coughs> Anything to that? Let's vote. Commissioner, oh, there it is. And that motion passes five to zero. On to public comment. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any online public comment? Yes, we do, and I also have a voicemail. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Oh. Hi, my name is Julie Rodriguez. My phone number is 941-580-7512. Resident on Fremont Street, 6355. Northport, Florida. The meeting is um, held tonight at 6 p.m. Um, regarding, there is no particular topic on this meeting, just some standard um, grievances brought forward. I um, just recently moved here December 5th from Sarasota County. I was not aware as a renter what the requirements were for trash pickup. It's not waste management. It's something very different in Northport. They pick up the trash at your neighbor's house. You're only allowed a particular can that they supply for you. Otherwise, you have to pay 150 that I do not have the means to pay. I have a family household of five and pets, and we cannot only use one trash can. With that said, Upon arrival on December 5th, Monday evening at 10 p.m., I had one week's worth of trash, put my trash out front. It was not picked up. I phoned about it. I was told that I could have a special pickup because I'm a new resident and unaware of their um, requirements here in Northport. The one-time courtesy pickup was done a week later. I was told to put my trash items that were now built up for two weeks in front of my yard next to the mailbox. It was picked up. I was pleased. I was also informed as a resident that I had two pickups a year. I called for my first pickup, bulk pickup, and I was told that that quote-unquote courtesy pickup 
pickup for trash was considered my two pickups for the year. Their calendar in Northport is unlike any other calendar I've ever heard of. It starts in October 2022. Yes, city manager, I'm wondering if someone might reach out uh, to that resident <clears throat> since we have contact information <clears throat> on them and try to clarify the trash removal policy of the city. Yes, ma'am, happy to do so. Thank you, I appreciate that. Go ahead, City Clerk. This is from Kiwanis Club. Commissioners, page 20 of the city's special event manual states, for any off-premise directional signage, applicants must submit an example of signs and must use one of four approved signage maps. Page eight says 25 off-site signs are permitted. Parks has the maps. However, after filling out the application, you learn the city doesn't allow signs in the right of way anymore due to a Supreme Court ruling. This is conflicting. The manual and ordinance say one thing and city staff says another. How was there such a change without commission direction or and public comment? Even if it's a proposed change to come before commission, why is it happening now? The 2015 Supreme Court ruling also says cities still can pass meaningful sign ordinances. It's reasonable to ask the city attorney for direction as it removed due process now because the code allows for signs and staff verbally says no. If it's believed the current code violates a Supreme Court order, why wasn't there urgency to fix the ordinance from 2015 to 2022? Nonprofits plan events in advance to get a city permit. Part of the process is buying signs to alert the public of an event that could bring new people, generate gas and sales tax and tourism. When the code is in conf conflict with staff interpretation, it's reasonable to believe the city staff would alert commissioners so that the business community and nonprofit sector isn't feeling like the city isn't working to fix the issue. Groups are finally coming out of COVID protocol and want to plan events. Commissioners approved a special events manual and application forms. Even if they were deemed unconstitutional, it's incumbent for commissioners to deal with it as an agenda item and allow the public to participate in the decision-making process. We want to do right by applying for a 14-day sign permit, allowing two fishing tourney signs in the front yard only at McKibben Park on the day of the free kids event doesn't help promote it citywide in advance help. Chris Streer. I have heard there is a new ordinance about signage along the right of way and other places around the city. On my way home today, I counted at least six signs along the right of way at the intersection of Sumter Boulevard and US 41. These are business signs. Are businesses the only ones allowed to have signs up? What is the rule for private citizens and nonprofits? Last year, all we had to do was apply for a permit show location on a map where the signs were going to be, put up the signs before the event, and take them down after the event. Now I hear you can only put up two signs. Who made this rule and why? I want to follow the rules, but it is getting more difficult each year. One person tells you one thing, someone else another. Who is in charge and why isn't the information the same no matter who you talk to? To me, this is the way it should be. Everyone needs to be on the same page. I have observed this is not, is not happening. People in charge say one thing, but staff workers say another. These two groups need to communicate more often so there's less confusion. I fill out a permit, tell you where on a map my signs will be. What is so difficult about that? I hope tonight this issue gets resolved. Thank you for reading this long comment. Jackie Clark Nacklin, commissioners, we are concerned that nonprofits, nonprofits and businesses haven't been given the opportunity to explain to the board how the city not allowing for signs in the right of way according to the current ordinance, has impacted their events. We are concerned that the city chose not to allow signs, but didn't give us the legal reason of how the city's ordinance violates the provisions in the Reed versus Gilbert Supreme Court decision. So much of the court's decision revolves around free speech and little to do with right-of-way usage. In banning signs in the right-of-way, has the city not allowed for its own stop signs and other caution signs? Please, commissioners, seek a legal opinion on this issue. Thank you very much for your interest in this matter, which impacted so many groups in our community. With regards to the above statement, I agree with it because it appears you, appears you are denying equal <coughs> access to nonprofit organizations and or private citizens the right to advertise their events, as you have done for regular businesses. This is not fair. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. First, I want to thank everyone in the city who provided comment on uh, the sign issue. And we have placed um, that topic on the agenda, I believe, for our meeting February 14th, city manager. Am I correct on that? Um, yes, ma'am. There may need to be a little bit more discussion about, you know, the 
direction of that meeting based on the memo that we sent out today in Correct. response to the questions that we received over the weekend. But ultimately, there are, there is recourse for the action that we've taken, and it explains why we've taken it. And we'll make sure that we post that because it is very sort of comprehensive to the situation and how we can move forward to a resolution. Yeah, yeah, and I think we have agreed that we do need to discuss this in public because there is um, a lot of confusion around that topic. Um, okay, we also have some. Can I ask? Can I ask? No. Okay. Can you hold it? Sure. Yeah. Um, we have some in-house public comment. Joan Morgan, if you would come up, please. Hi, Joan Morgan, Northport. I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of a program that's going to be going on. You are not alone, Part 3. Part 1 was started by our city hall, uh, by our city manager and everyone else in staff and staff at the city caring about uh, the mental health and conditions um, of our students, our school students, and our and our adults. Part three is called Ending the Silence. NAMI is putting it on. It's going to be Thursday, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Morgan Center. We're going to have a lot of groups there. Teen Court is going to be there. Kiwanis, the Florida Center, First Step, Holly's Hope, Valerie's House, Take Stock and Children, Suicide Prevention, Tidewell, uh, Jewish Families, uh, NAMI, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and Awaken Church. All of these groups have been meeting. I want to tell you, I thank you that this what the city started for part one. This is part three. Part two was our, our uh, anti-bullying, which was very, very successful. Sadly, we had a hurricane the week after, but hopefully that <laughs> message was remembered. Uh, these programs are very important and are getting some recognition, and it's so needed. We have people in trouble in this city. We have a lot of kids in trouble. I mean, a lot of the students that we have now in the high school, first of all, they got to the school and they found all the bars on the on the outside because someone's going to come in and shoot them. And then we had COVID and then we had this hurricane. So a lot of those kids that are in the high school have had so much turmoil in middle school over the years and they need our help and we need to be there for them. I'm so appreciative that... <coughs> The, the school system, the police department, city hall, and these nonprofit groups are working together on this. Another thing I have to mention, like everybody else seems to be tonight, I thought I was going to be the first is a sign ordinance. Okay, let me tell you, there's a lot of scuttlebutt. There's a lot of people worried and confused. There's a lot of uh, good programs, sports programs, nonprofit programs and all that need these signs to make sure that people know about them. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of people from the nonprofits and the sports world saying, you know, how are these people going to know when to register for Little League or whatever, or football or whatever. So I hope you can all get at it. And I hope that this is certainly done because, hey, signage is a very important issue for everybody. That's how we get our information. So thank you very much. And we hope people will be there Thursday, uh, the 26th at the Morgan Center from 6.30 to 8.30, and then we look forward to part four because we are going to continue this program with your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Morgan. Baldy Allender. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. I am Valde Olander, Northport Geographical Area. I have dignity. Please respond my dignity. <coughs> I came here in peace, and I am not a criminal. Stop treating me like one. Ask Garrison for verification. I have no contract with Northport Corporation, so you bylaws does not apply to me. I am using language from Florida Constitution, Langdon. I am uh, instructing you to remove police departmentalists off my back. He can sit over here. I'm waiting. All right. She can, he can sit over here. Don't treat me like Dred Scott of 1857. He was three-fifths of the vote. I am three minutes, Dred Scott. You now, in the content of your oath, no city law can eliminate constitutional protected right. This is self-described criminal 
by the 46th title of Florida, Slayton. Now I'm going to read you Ronald Reagan, Reagan farewell speech given January 11, 1989. Ours was the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of the government. And with the little words, we the people, we the people tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are a driver. The government is the car. And we decided where it should go and by what route and how fast. Almost all world's constitutions are documents in which the government tells the people what their privilege are. Our constitution is the document in which we the people tell the government what it is allowed to do. We the people are free. This belief has been underlying basis for everything I have tried to do the past eight, eight years. That's the Ronald Reagan. I wish you take it to your heart. I wrote you in my notes, discover what the visceral hatred, hatred is. Visceral hatred is against someone like me or against something like Oval Office, like the Constitution, like the Charter. You mention here that a lot of people are suffering. That's because of you. Uh, Justin Willis, you're next. <clears throat> Justin Willis, Northport resident. Good evening, commissioners and city manager. I'm sorry I'm here tonight. Um, but I'm here to fight for the greater good, for the small businesses, the big businesses, the nonprofits that help our city go around, for the food pantries that put out directional signs to feed your residents, for the realtors that put out open house signs to promote their businesses, for the sport leagues that entertain our children that can no longer put out signs, and for every resident that is affected by the lack of information that you are creating. After reading the memo sent by staff dated May 6, 2022, the proposed changes are nothing more than a memo and not formally adopted by policy, or not formally adopted policy by an ordinance of the Northport City Commission. Again, this is the decision of one staff member, which is in direct conflict with the City Commission's approved sign regulations, the city's charter, and the current codified ULDC. In January of 2022, staff had the commission change the time for special event applications from 60 days to 30 days. Yet we did not require coming to you for an ordinance to change whether or not we could put out signs. Why would they bring an ordinance for a change of dates, but not for something that limits knowledge to your residents? This is supposed to be the community of unity. Something as simple as this sign is creating a great division between your nonprofits and your businesses in the city itself. We as a community are uniting together to tell you that this is wrong. The commission should have a voice when it comes to the sign ordinance and the policy that is being followed. You, are, as, the, you as the commission are our legislative board. We elect the commissioners to be, our, to be the voice and to be our, represent, our representatives. We are asking you to be the voice of reason today. Direct the city manager to direct his staff to follow the current ordinance and code as written until a change has been made by the commission. We are spending too much time being reactionary to things that we do not need a reaction until we actually have a problem. On-premises signs and signs that relate to the use or purpose of the real estate for which the sign is physically located. Sign ordinances frequently allow on-premise signs, especially to identify a business but restrict or prohibit off-premises signs. The Sixth Circuit found that this distinction to be content-based called it neither a close call nor a difficult question. The court found Reed prohibited the ordinance from differentiating between on and off-premises signs because such distinction is based off of the sign's message, whether it is related to the property or not. This only applies to non-commercial speech. 
Sign ordinances that prohibit off-premise non-commercial signs are unconstitutional. This includes ordinances that do not permit, that do not permit businesses to display non-commercial signs. I'm asking you guys, please take action tonight that all collection be held, of any collection of um, special event signs be held until you guys have made a decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jeffrey Scott. Good evening, Commission. I'm going to talk about the state of our city. No matter how the city of Northport changes its plot lines or changes its talking points or even its script, we as a city always seem to end up in a similar situation, repeating the mistakes and missteps of the past. If you want to know the true state of our city, then listen up. The state of our city is a top-down culture that lacks sound judgment in garnering the public trust. The political activism displayed on the dais along with the internal forces behind the scenes has not served this community or its taxpaying residents in a reliable or responsible manner. I contend our local government bureaucracy is tone deaf and does not listen to the citizenry, refuses to abide by their oath of office, and will forever ignore the governing document, the Northport City Charter. As residents of this community, we are treated as a source of funding and little else. In other words, the taxpaying residents of the city have been taken advantage of far too long by senseless spending and empty promises. The time has come to rein in all the senseless spending, especially during these turbulent times. The time, this is a common sense smart policy that is needed at the present time. Yes, 2023 to be exact. As for the empty promises, that veil is being lifted whether the city of Northport approves of it or not. Let me be clear, the most important consideration for the state of our city is not necessarily what you do as city manager, but how you do it. Any baseless theories put forward by your administration will not serve any purpose whatsoever in moving our city to a better place in 2023. Thank you. Vanessa Carazone. Well, here we are again. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, clarify, of course, I'm here due to the signs. Um, you know, I was here in the 90s when uh, we were sitting in the hard chairs, not in this city hall, by the way, uh, <laughs> and uh, had the first original discussion about signs and the sign ordinance. It's actually one of the reasons why I ran for office back in the day. I was on the board when we passed the first sign ordinance in 2018. I was on the board or on the board back in 2002 when the first ordinance was passed, 2018 when it was updated. And in fact, um, here when the current codes uh, exist for special events and sign ordinances. So what I'm here to do is try to explain what the interpretation and intent was as being part of those who actually voted on it. And the interpretation and intent was to allow special events to have temporary use signs. It was to allow those who actually went through the process, filled out the application, and did what they had to do, they were allowed to do so. The irony is that by just having a staff member decide that they were no longer going to allow this, that you've almost created that unconstitutional defect that we were trying to fix back in 2016, 2017, and 2018. You are allowing for business signs, roofing signs, uh, all kinds of good Hurricane Ian signs uh, all over the place to exist, but those who want to go through the legal process that exists today are not allowed to do so. Think about that. It is the whole reason why we had this conversation then, and the whole reason a new conversation needs to take place. Um, in uh, closing, I just want to say that to have a discussion about this matter at 10 a.m. meeting is just uh, public participation is not going to be had. The people who are affected by this actually work. 
The people who are affected by this run businesses. They can't be here at 10 a.m. And it's unrealistic to think you're actually going to have public participation in something to this, to this degree at a 10 a.m. AM meeting. I just, I think uh, it's kind of asinine. Um, so in closing, uh, regardless of the ULDC's 10 year plus uh, update, that who knows when that's gonna ever come to fruition, legislation currently exists. It currently exists, it is in place, and there is absolutely no way you should legally stop or prevent those legislative codes from taking action and being in place as it is today. Ma'am, you're out of thank time, you. and thank you. Before we move on to announcements, I do want to recognize two of our public speakers, Mrs. Morgan and Ms. Carazone, who both served as commissioners uh, to the city of Northport. So thank you for your service. Moving on to announcements, A23-0154. City Clerk, would you read this, please? The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Trust Fund Board of Trustees, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Veterans Park Advisory Committee, and Zoning Board of Appeals. Upcoming expirations for the following boards and committees. There are no upcoming expirations. Sarasota County Advisory Council vacancies. One resident of Northport to serve on the Bicycle Pedestrian Trail Advisory Committee. One resident of Northport to serve on the Citizens Oversight Committee for School Facility Planning. One resident of Northport to serve on the Parks Advisory and Recreation Council. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Um, on to the consent agenda. City Manager, have item, any items been pulled? No, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I'm requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Move to approve consent agenda as presented. Second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda as presented, made by Commissioner Emmerich and seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Anything to that, gentlemen? Then let's vote. And that item passes five to zero. Um, on to public hearings. Um, PLF 22 198. Um, this item is quasi judicial. City Clerk, could you read the petition title and swear in those willing to give testimony? Consideration of petition number PLF 22 198, Arbor Oaks at the Woodlands Final Plat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God? Thank you, City Clerk. Do any of my fellow commissioners have any ex parte communications in this matter? Commissioner McDowell? No, ma'am. No. Uh, none for me, Vice Mayor? No, nothing. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Great. Uh, City Clerk, are there any aggrieved parties for this item? Thank you. Um, on to presentations. Applicant, you have 20 minutes. Good evening, Commission. My name is Strickland Smith. I'm with Hype Design, and I have been sworn. Uh, I am here tonight uh, seeking uh, approval of the final plat for Arbor Oaks at the Woodlands. Uh, Arbor Oaks is a... <laughs> 193 acre, 341 unit single family subdivision located at the uh, northeast quadrant of Plantation Boulevard and Panacea Boulevard in the Woodlands. Uh, this, uh, this plat uh, is consistent with the approved DMP for that project, as well as the approved infrastructure and subdivision plans. Um, the plat has been reviewed and approved by staff and the city's uh, surveyor. Uh, consulting surveyor, and uh, there is a approximately three point one million dollar infrastructure bond in place for the for the project. Um, there is, uh, uh, and the 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 plat did go to uh, PZAB on January fifth and was recommended for approval. There are two 
minor revisions I'd like to introduce to the record on the uh, the owner's certificate of the on the cover sheet of the plats. Uh, the owner of the project is Pulte Home Corporation, LLC. Uh, Pulte Home Corporation is a Michigan limited liability company. On the cover of the current version of the plat is listed as a Florida limited liability company. We'd like to make that revision uh, on the final version of the Mylars once it's approved uh, to be signed by the city. Um, and we also, um, in the uh, listing of the tracks on the current version of the plat, um, the, the C tracks are listed and written as C1 through the word through C27. Um, we'd prefer to list those tracks out individually, uh, C1, C2, C3, et cetera. So it's a, it's a typographical change, but does not change the context of the plat or anything within the, the boundary or, or um, details of the plat itself. So requesting approval of that final plat tonight uh, with the, um, the two revisions to the certificate of ownership. Uh, thank you, sir. Staff, you have 20 minutes. Good evening. For the record, Noah Fossick, Planning and Zoning Division, and I have been sworn. Petition PLF 22198 is for the final plat of Arbor Oaks at the Woodlands. The plat is located in the Panacea Development of Regional Impact, being located south and west of I-75, east of Plantation Boulevard, and north of Panacea Boulevard. The final plat adds <clears throat> 341 single-family detached lots on approximately 193.95 acres. The development master plan was approved in November 2021 by the City Commission. The infrastructure and subdivision plans were approved by City staff in May 2022. A bond in the amount of $3,138,868.37 has been received by the City. The City Surveyor has reviewed and approved the plat, and PZAB at their January 5th regular meeting uh, voted unanimously four to zero to recommend approval of PLF 22198. <laughs> and to echo the applicant's statement, there is a few clerical changes that were being proposed to this plat should you <clears throat> should the board deem to approve them. Uh, one change is to correct the dedication language to read a Michigan limited liability company where it said a Florida limited liability company as well as a change to individually list all the tracks from C1 to C27, where the dedication language said C1 through C27. These changes are limited to clerical amendments and do not impact the plat itself. Thus, staff recommends approval of PLF 22198 with the changes described. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fosick. Any rebuttal by the applicant? No. Staff? Staff has no rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any public online public comment for this topic? I don't see any in-house, so I will open up the floor to commissioner questions. Uh, commissioner McDowell? Uh, yes, Mayor, thank you very much. Um, reviewing the plat on sheet two, um, it says under the plat notes number six, this plat is subject to the following encumbrances and or easements, and it has a colon, but nothing is listed. It's all absent. And I'm wondering if number six should be there or if there should be some wording to that effect. Uh, Commissioner, I don't have the... Uh Specific answer to that question, it sounds like that might have been an omission. Maybe it was a typical note that the surveyor has on plats that did not need, that, would, that maybe wasn't needed, that wasn't completely taken off. Um, I'm happy to uh, get with the surveyor after the hearing and report back to staff um, if, that, if there's something that needs to be added there. But it um, sounds like it was an omission. Okay. Um. The other thing is, is many times when we approve these new developments and their plats, years and years and years later, staff changes, commission changes, and they say, oh no, city is supposed to maintain it. No, the developer or the HOA is supposed to maintain it. 
And there becomes this kind of a challenge and struggle. And I am wondering who is responsible for roads and sidewalk maintenance, landscaping, because that's not on this plat. And I'm trying to look out for long after we're all gone and staff is gone to make sure that the documents are clear and concise as possible. So that is actually addressed under the dedication language on the cover sheet. Um, they're listed out as the specific track names um, and not specifically called out necessarily as the roadways or um, any other infrastructure, but they are all dedicated to the Arbor Oaks at the Woodlands Homeowners Association. So they would be private roadways and the landscaping would be maintained by the Homeowners Association and so on and so forth. Would there be any pro, because when I look at the plat, it, it says track whatever number, and it's this large clump. Mm -hmm. um, would there be any prohibition to say, hey, the, the roads and sidewalks are going to be maintained by, so that it's not just the track, it's specific to the roads and landscaping and sidewalks? So on the actual plat sheets, you can see the track numbers listed out with the roadway names um, and whatnot. It, it could be the commission's direction to add that language to the dedication if you so wish, um, but it's not necessary for that to be clear on this plat. And I understand that we can request it mm -hmm. and, and I will be seeking um, that request from my fellow commissioners because it's not always clear. It's clear here today, but not 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So I, I just wanna make sure that future commissions aren't gonna, and staff aren't gonna have any problems. So thank you. That's all the questions I have, Mayor. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. Um, Commissioner, did you want to seek a consensus and, on that item? And Mayor, I don't know if now would be the appropriate time until after we've closed the hearing. Maybe a city attorney can advise us on proper protocol. Yeah, thank you. We, have, we need to follow the quasi-judicial procedure in the order it's presented. Okay, thank you, uh, city attorney. So we are, I'm not seeing any other questions um, <coughs> from my fellow commissioners. So closing arguments, staff. Staff has no closing argument, thank you. Applicant? Uh, yes, ma'am, just to uh, Commissioner McDowell's concern, uh, I would just point out that the, the certificate of ownership and dedication, first of all, the way this is written on this plat is very consistent with how you will see it in, in any jurisdiction in regards to the you know, chapter 177 rules that govern platting in, in the state of Florida. Um, to your specific point, though, in that paragraph, you'll see where it says private in the, the second paragraph of the dedication, and it lists the different tracks. And as uh, Mr. Fossick was pointing out, um, the, the, the road right away is um, a specific track that's listed in there. And I apologize, I don't have that full copy of that plat with me. Um, Mr. Fossick, maybe you do. If you if we could show the commissioner where the track is specifically listed as um, that covers the right of ways, um, so you'll see the the different tracks that are listed as private. Underneath there, there's a the, it says public, and the only thing that's being dedicated to the public in this case is track S1, which is the lift station, because the utilities in the project, though it is a private community. The water and sewer in the project will be owned and maintained by the city of Northport, which is which is standard practice for a private community. Um, but that is the only tract, the, the only piece of land that will be dedicated to the, the city because they'll, they'll own and maintain that lift station. Um, so the, the dedication language, I think, is pretty, pretty clear for the city attorney or others that are familiar with uh, how dedication language is, is set up and how it establishes private versus public. Um, I would suggest that there's no need to make any modification to the dedication language, um, that it can be um, uh, determined 
pretty clearly by the city attorney or others that are looking at this plat, what is private and public uh, relative to Arbor Oaks. It is a private community. It is gated private community. The streets, the common areas, the parks, the sidewalks uh, are all maintained by the, um, the uh, will, will be maintained by the Arbor, Arbor Oaks Homeowners Association. Um, and once again, the public track, the only public track is track S1. Thank you for that, sir. Um, at this point, I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. We'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, right, Commissioner. Hold on a second. Since it's closing, I make a motion to approve PLF 22-198 as presented and find that based on competent stamp, substantial evidence that Harbor, Harbor Oaks at the Woodlands Final Plot complies with the Unified Land Development Code and Florida Statutes 177 with the following changes to be made. Um, changes regarding the ownership of Pulte Home LLC, a Michigan? Yes, ma'am. Uh, LLC, also to update the plat tracks and list individually C1 through C27. Thank you, Commissioner. Do I hear a second? I'll, I'll second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve petition number PLF 22-198 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Arbor Oaks at the Woodlands Final Plat complies with the Unified Land Development Code and the Florida State, the Florida Statutes Chapter 177 with three clerical revisions to the plat ownership um, to Pulte Home LLC, a Michigan company, um, and modifying the tracks, listing them out individually. The motion was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Vice Mayor White. Mayor. Any discussion? I'd like to have you restate, since you restated the motion, my motion was to update the list of C1 through C27 individually. Uh, would you like to read that back, City Clerk? A motion was made by Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Vice Mayor White, to approve petition number PLF 22-198 with the below changes and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Arbor Oaks at the Woodlands final plat complies with the Unified Land Development Code and the Florida Statutes Chapter 177. Change number one, correct the certificate of ownership and dedication language from Florida Limited Liability Company to Michigan Limited Liability Company. Number two, update and individually list plat tracks C1 through C27. Individually. I said individually, yes. Thank you, I missed it. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else to that? Uh, to the motion, Mayor? Yes. Um, I appreciate the um, applicant um, stating what he did about the ownership and the, the public and the private. I think what might have thrown me off was all the C1s and all these letters and not seeing the actual wording. So thank you very much for that clarity. Okay, seeing nothing else, let's vote. That motion passes unanimously five to zero. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mayor. I forgot about the line six needing to be rectified on the plat notes. I don't know how to get that addressed at this point. City Attorney. City Attorney. I forgot to include it with the motion. So I mean, there's, there's no legal issue with this line. This is standard language that you often see. And if there's something to list, they list it after. Or there's no... Yes, I understand that it's not listed, but there's no legal impact to it. Simply saying it's um, it, it's burdened by the following encumbrances and then nothing being there. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, moving on, uh, PLF-22-225, um, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, would you read the petition title and swear in those wishing to provide testimony? Petition number PLF-22-225, Welland Park Village E, Track 4, Replat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand? You swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God. Yeah. Thank you, City Clerk. Uh, fellow commissioners, have you had any ex parte communications <coughs> on this item? Commissioner McDowell? No, ma'am. Commissioner Stoke? No, ma'am. No for me, Vice Mayor? It's a no. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Uh, City Clerk, are there any aggrieved parties to this item? Great, let's move on to presentations. Um, applicant, 20 minutes. I take five, it'll be a lot. Uh, John Lazinski, Senior Vice President of Ellen Park. Uh, this is a replat, the track four of the Village E plat of subdivision. Uh, track four, five, track 502A and 503A were all kind of just shapes were changed to accommodate a parking lot in the size needed for a big box user that we anticipate will start construction in the second quarter of this year. So it's just modifying those couple tracks to enable a parking lot. Thank yes. you. Staff? Good evening, commissioners. Uh, for the record, Sherry Willett Grandin, Planning and Zoning Division. I have been sworn. As you can see on the screen, the, um, this is the replat of PLF-22-225. The purpose of the replat is to reconfigure Tract 4 to Tract 4A for a big box store and fuel pump stations. Tract 303 is a right-of-way, drainage, and public utility easement. Tracks 502A, 503A contain stormwater management, ponds, and wetlands. The total site is approximately 38.6445 acres. The site is located in West Village's uh, Village E, and it is in the mixed use area east of uh, Southwest Village's Parkway and south of Tamiami Trail. The West Village's Improvement District has reviewed and approved the plat. In addition to the contracted um, city surveyor, there is a surety bond will be in place for the infrastructure, including sanitary sewer and potable water at the time of major site and development for this project. And it is in compliance with Florida Statutes Chapter 177. The Planning and Zoning Advisory Board has heard this item January 5th and voted unanimously 4-0 to zero to approve the plat. And staff is respectfully requesting approval of PLF 22-225. Thank you. Thank you. Any rebuttal applicant? I have none. Staff? Staff has no rebuttal. Uh, City Clerk, is there any online public comment for this item? And I don't see any in-house, so I'll open the floor to Commissioner questions. Uh, seeing none, let's move on to closing arguments, staff. Staff has no closing arguments. Thank you. Applicant? I have no closing arguments. Then I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. I move to approve petition PLF 22-225 as presented and find that based on competent substantial evidence, the Welland Park Village E Track 4 replat complies with the Unified Land Development Code in the Florida Statute Chapter 177. Second. Right. Uh, was that Commissioner McDowell? Thank you. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner McDowell to approve petition number PLF 22-225 as presented and find that based on the competent sub substantial evidence, the Welland Park Village E Track 4 replat complies with the Unified Land Development Code and the Florida 
Statutes Chapter 177. Anything to that? Then let's vote. That motion passes five to zero. On to PLF-22-227. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, can you read the petition title, please, and swear in those wishing to provide testimony? Petition number PLF-22-227, Welland Park, Downtown, Track 6 and 9, Ray Platt. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand? Where affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Um, any ex parte communications, Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor? No. None for me. Commissioner Stokes? No, ma'am. Commissioner McDowell? No, ma'am. City Clerk, are there any aggrieved parties for this item? There are none. Then let's move on to presentations. Applicant, you have 20 minutes. General Mazinski, Senior Vice President with Welland Park. This replat modifies track six of the original downtown Welland Park plat. It breaks that area that was approximately 10 acres into three lots. 6A is the parcel that is under contract for a boutique hotel. The current designs are about a four story and 150 room hotel. Track 6B is for a public parking lot, and 6C, roughly 5.3 acres, will be a future development within downtown. Uh, it grants the, dedicates the right of way for the extension of Market Way, which we've been using as access into downtown for construction, uh, to allow for the construction into uh, for the hotel. And it does modify the shape of track nine, which you all are aware is the 0.6 acres that goes to the city for the future city hall annex. Uh, the reason that changed is our engineers, when they first laid out downtown in the first plat, they didn't give enough width in the roadway for market way to allow for the roadway and parking on both sides like we did elsewhere in downtown. We wanted to keep the streets uh, consistent. So that's why track nine is it. Of it. We have a market way deal has been issued and we have since started construction of the extension of market way and those plans also have another street that stubs off market way along the south side of track 13 that goes out to West Village's Parkway where there'll be a right turn line in and that will become the construction access for the hotel. So we don't have to bring construction traffic past <coughs> Grand Living, the Welcome Center or businesses on in downtown thank you staff thank you for the record sherry will at grandin planning and zoning division i have been <clears throat> sworn as you can see um the reply as stated by the applicant is to further um to subdivide tract six into additional tracks for the hotel public parking and the boundary of track nine is being configured reconfigured to align with the roadway in addition, this is consistent with the INF 22-138, uh, which was part of the infrastructure plan for the expansion of Market Way. The site is located in West Village's Village D. The um, West Village's Improvement District has reviewed and approved the plat. In addition to the contracted city surveyor, the plat has been reviewed to be consistent with Florida Statutes Chapter 177. The Planning and Zoning Advisory Board has heard this plat at the January 5th, 2023 meeting and at a four to zero vote approved, uh, voted to approve. Um, staff is recommending approval of PLF-22-227. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any rebuttal applicant? I have no rebuttal. Staff? Staff has no rebuttal, thank you. You are welcome. City Clerk, do we have any online public comment for this item? We do not. And I don't see any in-house, so I will open up the floor to Commissioner <coughs> questions. Okay, I don't see any, so let's move on to closing arguments. Staff? 
Jeff has no closing arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Applicant? I have no closing arguments. Then I'm going to close this public hearing and request a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead. I move to approve petition TLF 22-227 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Welland Park downtown track six and nine replat complies with the unified, the unified land development code in the Florida statute chapter 177. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve petition number PLF 22-227 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence of the Welland Park downtown track six and nine replat complies with the unified land development code and Florida statutes chapter 177. That motion was made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? Seeing none, let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you both very much. Moving on to PLF-22-213. Uh, this is another quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, can you read the petition title and swear in those wishing to give testimony? Consideration of petition number PLF-22-213, Everly at Welland Park Final Plat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you guide? Yes, ma'am. Good. Um, any ex parte communications? Commissioner Emmerich? No. Ma Vice Mayor? No. None for me. Commissioner Stokes? No. Commissioner McDowell? No, ma'am. City Clerk, are there any agreed parties for this matter? There are none. Okay, then let's roll right into presentations. Applicant? John Wazinski, Senior Vice President, Welland Park. This plat, along with the next one, comprise our village K. We had VDPP here about a year ago. Everly, which is bounded on the north by Minnesota Beach Road, on the west by uh, West Village Parkway, on the south by the city county line. And on the east will be uh, the next plat. Everly has 241 lots, a mixture of 62-foot lots, 75-foot lots, and 85-foot lots. This is intended to be the most upscale community to date in Welland Park. Uh, we have three custom builders working uh, in the community, John Cannon Homes, Neil Custom Homes, and Homes by Lee Weatherton. The 62-foot lots will be built by uh, Homes by West Bay. They're around uh, a 50-acre lake. That lake was dug and is part of uh, the West Village's uh, parkway extension. We plan on delivering lots to builders here in the next 45 days. Okay, thank you. Staff? Good evening again. For the record, Noah Fawcett, Planning and Zoning Division, I have been sworn. Petition PLF 22213 is the final plat for Everly at Welland Park. The plat is located within Village K of Welland Park. The final plat adds 241 single-family detached lots on approximately 259 acres. The infrastructure and subdivision plans for Village K, which also includes the areas uh, for the final plat of Lakesfur at Welland Park, which you will hear later, and this final plat were approved by city staff in September 2022. A bond in the amount of $7,424,140.08 has been received by the city. The Everly at Welland Park Master Homeowners Association has accepted the street tree and landscape easements. The West Village's Improvement District and the city surveyor have reviewed and approved this plat. At their January 5th regular meeting, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board voted unanimously 4 to 0 to recommend approval of PLF 22213. Thus, staff recommends approval of PLF 22213. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any rebuttal, applicant? No rebuttal. All right. Staff? Staff is no rebuttal. Thank you. 
Uh, City Clerk, any online public comment? <clears throat> I don't see any in-house, so I will open up the floor to commission questions. Seeing none, I'll ask for closing arguments, staff. Staff has no closing argument, thank you. Applicant? Applicant has no closing arguments. Great. Then I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Thank you. Go ahead. Make a motion to approve petition number PLF 22-213 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, Everly at Welland Park fin final plat complies with the ULDC and the Florida State Statute Chapter 177. Do I hear a second? Second. Ooh, it's a tie. I'll give it to Commissioner Emmerich. We have a motion on the floor to approve petition number PLF 22-213 as presented and find that based on competent substantial evidence, Everly at Welland Park final plat complies with the Unified Land Development Code and Florida Statutes Chapter 177. The motion was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, gentlemen? Then let's vote, please. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you both. <clears throat> Moving on to PLF-22-217. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, if you would read the petition title and swear in those wishing to provide testimony. Consideration of petition number PLF-22-217, Lakesburg at Welland Park, final plot. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you guide? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any ex parte communications? Commissioner McDowell? Nope. Commissioner Stokes? No, ma'am. None for me. Vice Mayor? No. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Then let's move on to presentations. Oh, I'm sorry. City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties? No. Then now let's move on to presentations. Applicant? My reference it. Yeah, uh, can you share the screen? Okay. Uh, perfect. Thank you. John Lzinski, Senior Vice President of Welland Park. Just to the east of Everly, which was just approved, will be Lakespur. These two neighborhoods will be uh, separated by a 30 acre lake that runs north south, as well as a regional trail that will tie our properties to the south and this trail goes through this property will go through the new school campus that we can coordinate with uh, the Sarasota County School District and that school campus is just above that little uh, hand there it's you can see the old uh, ag road from that point almost the river road that 30 <coughs> acres is what the Sarasota County School District's working on as a K through 12 campus uh, so the bike path will continue there and then continue north of Minnesota Beach Road and go all the way up to Plainmore. That's in the process in a separate application. This neighborhood is uh, two, roughly 220 uh, acres. This first plat has 137 50 foot single family lots. And as you go to the east and River Road, uh, Sun Drop runs east west. Sundrop South will be single family. Sundrop North will be coach homes. And you know, those will be part of future application. But this is consistent with the VDPP, probably a little less density than we were approved for. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Fawcett. Good evening again. Uh, for the record, Noah Fawcett, Planning Zoning Division. I have been sworn. Petition PLF 22-217 is the final plat of Lakespur at Welland Park. The plat, again, is located within Village K of Welland Park. The final plat adds 137 single-family detached lots on approximately 220 acres. 
There are also several future development tracks which may accommodate future residential development to be determined at a later date. The infrastructure and subdivision plans for Village K, which includes the areas within this final plat and the final plat for Everly at Welland Park, which you have just heard, were approved by city staff in September 2022. A bond in the amount of $7,424,140.08 has been received by the city. The Lakesburg at Wumelland Park Masters Home, Master Homeowners Association has accepted the street tree and landscape easement. The West Village's Improvement District and the City Surveyor have reviewed and approved the plat. At their January 5th regular meeting, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board voted unanimously, unanimously 4 0 to recommend approval of PLF 22217. Thus, staff recommends approval of PLF 22217. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, any rebuttal, Mr. Luzinski? I have no rebuttal. Mr. Fosick? Staff has no rebuttal. Thank you. You are welcome. City Clerk, any online public comment? There is nothing in house, so I will open up the floor to commissioner questions. Not seeing any, we'll move on to closing arguments. Mr. Fosick? Staff has no closing argument. Thank you. Mr. Luzinski? I have no closing argument. Great, thank you. Um, then I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead. I move to approve petition number PLF 22-217 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, Lake Spur at Welland Park final plat complies with the Unified Land Development Code, the Florida Statutes, Chapter 177. Do I have a second? Um, uh, Commissioner Emrich. We have a motion on the floor to approve petition number PLF 22-217 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, Lake Spur at Welland Park Final Plat complies with the Unified Development Code and the Florida Statutes Chapter 177. That motion was made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Emrich. Anything to that? Then let's vote. And that motion passes Thank five you. to zero. Thank you, John. You're welcome. We are moving on to ordinances, first reading. Um, ordinance number 2023-07. Um, City Clerk, would you read this by title only, please? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, motion, Mayor. Okay, McDowell. To have the City Clerk read ordinance number 2023-07 by title only. Terrific, do I have a second? Second. Okay, I think I'll recognize Stokes on that one. We have a motion on the floor to direct city clerk to read the ordinance by title only, um, made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Anything to that? If not, then let's vote. That motion carries five to zero. Go ahead, city clerk. Ordinance number 2023-07, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, repealing and replacing chapter four, article one of the code of the city of Northport, Florida, relating to advisory boards and committees, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you for that. This is your item. Would you like to introduce it? Yes. So this um, replacement of the code is based off of a, uh, the commission workshop that was held on September 6, 2022, with the feedback that I received from commission. I am here to answer any questions. I can tell you that the um, main changes that were in here were the residency requirement for changing it to six months from one year. Youth members, we changed the language to state 14 years old and in high school. Term limits, we changed the term to be three-year term limits. Removal, I added the um, removal by majority vote of a board to recommend removal to the city commission of a board member who fails to comply with any city 
Commission policies for order and decorum, as well as a memorandum through the applicable charter officer, a board staff liaison may recommend to the City Commission the removal of a member who fails to comply with any City Commission policies for order and decorum. We updated the language regarding unexcused absence versus excused absences to allow a board member to have three unexcused absences and two excused absences before they are deemed to be resigned. We also provide criteria for an excused absence. And I had added a section for a commission liaison. Thank you. Any questions, commissioners? Comments? Commissioner McDowell. Uh, yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, I noticed when I was comparing the new um, proposed language in this first reading to the old existing code, there's a couple of things that I found that were missing. And I was wondering if maybe city clerk could address why they are not included. The first one is in the previous existing code, uh, section 4.5B, it mentioned sunshine training, um, ethics, um, that kind of stuff. It's not in here. And I would think making sunshine part of this board would be part of this new code. The sunshine and the training is going to fall under the policy that's going to be coming before the commission. We are going to merge advisory boards with the commission um, decorum policy to provide all of those requirements in there for them as well since they are procedural. When is that coming? I'm hoping March, the end of the last meeting in March. Uh, conflict of interest was on 4.3L. Mm -hmm. That is not in this new code. Um, I don't know. It was only one little sentence. There will be where the commission is going to take into consideration the number of conflicts of interest. That is also going to be in that policy as well. Can I ask why aren't we I'm seeing them together so we can make sure they meld and merge and blend appropriately? <laughs> it originally was in this in this change. We decided that some things would be better off in the, the policy instead of in the code. So I pulled those out and it was it was a last minute thing. Um, so rule, rules of decorum. <coughs> that will come back to commission as a policy. And so for clarification, uh, <clears throat> I worked with the city clerk on this ordinance. And so we were looking for consistency with removing some administrative items from the code that were not actually more like law and putting them into city commission mm -hmm. policy as the city commission has done for its own board and on some other items as well. It's certainly if it's the board's will to see these two documents together, you can you know, direct that in your motion to continue on this ordinance. But I, I believe the city clerk was, you know, once we determined that that was the best route, I think she was interested in trying to get this document before you sooner rather than later because you had specifically directed it. Anything else, Commissioner? Yeah, um, the other thing is, is that uh, previous uh, code 4.10 um, stated that a certificate of appreciation would be sent. Um, I don't want that to get lost in any shuffle. Um, again, these codes and survive all of us, and I want to make sure that there is some type of recognition. Okay. And if it's in the code, it gets done. If it's not, oops, we forgot, and that's not appropriate. So I, I would like to see if we can get a consensus to add back in, wherever it's appropriate, Section 4.10 regarding Certificate of Appreciation, Mayor. Um, so we do have a request for a consensus made by Commissioner McDowell to add back in Section 4.10. City Attorney, I did just saw your hand. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. May I suggest for the Commission that, in, in my opinion, that would be appropriate for the Commission policy? Reminding the Commission the difference is that the City Code is our law book. It's our book of our city laws. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not a law to send someone a certificate of appreciation. There's no enforcement if you do not. In my opinion, that's more appropriate for a policy adopted by a resolution, but it is up to the will of the Board. 
Okay, thank it, you for that, City Attorney. May I ask Go a follow-up question? Go ahead, please. So where does it get captured that it will be done? So you can include that in the City Commission policy that the City Clerk said would be coming forward to capture the administrative side of the board, of the advisory boards. So is this policy, is it just a commission policy? It is a commission approved policy, but it's going to cover advisory boards as well. How do the advisory boards know that this policy will exist? If you're- We one... will be giving them the policy. They will get the policy. They are, when we are providing training to them now, and we do let them know that there is a policy coming forward as well for them. All right. I guess consensus will be irrelevant. So I don't know how much time I have left, Mayor, but I do have a couple other ones. Um, if you can make it quick. Sure. Um, under E, removal, um, E2B, it says the board member has three unexcused absences and two excused absences. Personally, I think it should be two and two. Three unexcused absences and two excused absences seems kind of excessive. If you do two and two, then there's no reason to even separate the two of them because you currently have four unexcused absences. So there would really be no benefit of having an excused absence if you're just if you are going to be removed for having four. Um City Attorney, this might be for you. Uh, number 4.4 .4 under meetings and letter three, I'm sorry, number three. The board may schedule special meetings and workshops by a majority vote, no problem. The chairperson is also authorized to call or schedule a special meeting or workshop unilaterally. How can the chair do something unilaterally when they work as a board and the chair says, hey, I want to have a special meeting, they have to coordinate that. I, I don't understand that sentence. We can't even do anything unilaterally. <laughs> so, you know, so first it is a business decision whether you want to allow your chairs to be able to do this. Of course, they would have to coordinate and work with the liaison for scheduling purposes. Um, as, as written, this would allow the chair to determine, hey, we need to have a special meeting or we need to have a workshop and not to have to seek approval of the other members of the advisory board in the public meeting in order to schedule that. But that's a business decision for you all to decide whether you want to confer that type of authority on the board member, on the chairperson. Do you want to speak, City Clerk? Oh, no. Okay. Commissioner um, Emmerich has his light on. I didn't oh, know if he I'm wanted so to speak to that go or if he wants to wait until Emmerich. I'm done. You go. That's all right. I've been giving the jump ball to the other person all night. So I'm used to it. <laughs> now, I got a question for the, the absences there. You sort of got me a little confused. You got three unexcused, two excused. Is it the five absences total kicks them off the board or what? What if they had four unexcused and one excused. They wouldn't, they would make, if they have four unexcused absences, they've resigned from the board. That is the way it's currently written. So it also says in the code, the current code on excused absences, but doesn't explain how to get an excused absence or that there is even a process for an excused absence. So this was to provide more clarity to allow them that if they do have a medical issue or one of the extenuating stamps, circumstances that we have listed, that they could use that to not have all of their absences held against them and then be removed from the board. So the excused would give them one more absence over having four unexcused absences. But you said that the three unexcused. Four. Okay, well you said three and two. So it would still be four unexcused absences? Four unexcused, they get their resign They're from gone. the board. If they have three unexcused and they have an excused, they're still on the board. If they have three unexcused and two excused, still on the board. But if they miss one more, they're resigned from the board. Even if it's excused or not? We don't want to get in the habit of allowing them to continuously have excused absences. No, I understand that. But I wanted, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is where the actual cutoff is. Uh, for if you're, 
If you're having excused absences, you can have two plus three unexcused. That's total and then five safe. absences. And then after that, if you miss any more, you're done. Okay. Once you get That's what I wanted to understand where you're coming up with these yeah. numbers are and where the cutoff was. So it is not abused. Yes. So. Thank you. I got That's good. That's all I needed. Follow along question, because I thought I had it until Commissioner McDowell, I mean, Commissioner Emmerich uh, poked at it. Let's say someone has three excused absences and no unexcused absences. Are they on or off the board? They'd have one more. They get four. It comes to four. We don't want to, because there has the... You don't want them to miss. I think currently it has a certain percentage of the board's meetings as well within the year. So trying to find a middle ground to have them not miss the, I think it's 25% of the board meetings, and some of them obviously meet more than others, but to allow them the option to also have a chance for an excused absence if, and this kind of came out during COVID with a lot of people having to miss due to COVID or family members to provide that option. But they're also now, they're able to do the hybrid meetings as well as long as we have a physical quorum. So there's right, right. other Mayor, ways to keep them on the board. You know, as, as written, there is no limit to the number of excused absences. Okay, that that's, what, that's what I was trying to get at. So, you know, okay. if, if, if the board has an idea of what they want with respect to these numbers, we can go back and make sure that the way it's written, you know, matches that, or if not, we can revise that for second reading if that's what you all want. Yeah, well, I think my request would be to just make it clear that as long as an absence is excused, they're okay. But I'm sort of thinking we should even have a limit to that. So the way it's currently written, again, it wasn't clear to me how many excused absences are allowed. Unlimited? No. <laughs> Well, as, as currently written, I think that, yeah. that it is. Or even if you have, like, the limit here is three unexcused and two excused, total of five. Well, if you have two unexcused but three excused, then, then you're not. I mean, so there are different ways to approach it once we understand what you want. Right. You may say, hey, even if they're excused and totally justified, we think once you hit five absences regardless, that's just too much to be an effective board member, so we want right. that cut off. And we can, you know, wordsmith the language to meet that intent if you want something like that. Right. Uh, um, and that's where I was sort of going. I would want a limit. And, and I think since we allow five absences, I don't really clear mm -hmm. which type. I think at that point, someone is off the board. Um, more than three unexcused, I'm good with that. But I think we should have a limit of five total. I don't know how others feel, but that would be my input. Um, Couple of other comments, and I'll come back to you, Commissioner McDowell, because I've not had a shot yet. Um, I, I saw that all of the, the terms of all of the advisory boards were increased to three years. I think the request for that increase came from the Community Economic Development Advisory Board specifically, and their request was based on the fact that their projects and sort of um, work view is longer than a lot of the other boards. And so I think three years is very appropriate for CDAP. My concern about increasing all of them to three years would be for some of those boards, that might be more of a commitment than some folks are willing to make and might scare people off. So I would be um, personally more comfortable just increasing CDAB to the three years and keeping the others two years. If I may, yes, in talking please. with current board members that I've engaged with, they do prefer the longer term. All of them did? That I've spoken to, yes. Okay, well, I've not spoken with yeah. them, so <laughs> if they all feel that way, that's, that's good with me. Um, and my only other comment um, would be commissioner attendance at advisory committee meetings, um, I just think that's ill-advised. Um, I think we, we want our advisory groups to feel unencumbered. Um, I know for myself, I, I can't speak for my fellow commissioners, but 
Um, I sometimes have a hard time containing my opinion, and I don't think that would be appropriate uh, for a commissioner on a, an advisory board. So uh, my feeling is that we'd be better off just not having us involved in them at all. Um, Commissioner Stokes, have you spoken yet? No. And then I'm going to let you go, and then I'll go back to uh, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I also concur on that one. I'm, I'm not at all so comfortable with the commissioner being that advisory board. Audio. I'm sorry. <laughs> I also concur with Mayor. Um, I don't think a commissioner should be at the advisory boards. I also would have a hard time not weighing in, and I'm not sure that that would be appropriate. Um, I also, I mean, for what it's worth, the excused and unexcused absences, having sat on an advisory board where repeatedly there were absences which made quorums virtually mm -hmm. impossible, I just don't see why we don't set three excuses, three regardless of excuses, that's it. I know how difficult it is to get folks to join the advisory boards, but the reality is if they volunteer and then they don't show up, it's just as bad as not having them there to begin with. So that's my take on that one. Other than that, that's all I have to say on that's this matter. It. Um, okay, back to you, Commissioner McDowell, and then I'll go to you, Commissioner Emmerich. Well, before we get a motion, I've got a couple consensuses I'd like to get. So um, before we get to that point, um, let's hear from Commissioner. I have other questions and comments I'd like to raise about the written document. Okay, go ahead. Um, public comment, um, letter E. When it, uh, I'm trying to s understand when is general public comment. That's what we call it at, at our meetings is general public comment. It says here the time for public comment must be designated in each agenda, but it also talks about allocating time for agenda items. It is the same as with commission and for the advisory boards, we have one public comment, general public comment in the beginning and the end, and then on each agenda item. Okay. Um, thank you for that clarification. Um, an official act, uh, letter E1, uh, an official act involving no more than a ministerial act may not include um, public comment. Is that what I'm reading in one? Yes. Why would we not that want? Is, for example, like on, how commission has consents, consent, the consent agenda. That's not open for public comment. We don't open that for public comment. That is ministerial. It, when when it's something's pulled from the consent agenda, you okay. ask if there's public comment, but those aren't, that's not required public comment section. Thank you very that. much. And then the next question, and maybe this is city attorney, I don't know. A meeting that is exempt from Florida State Statutes 286, is that like a shade meeting? It, it's a meeting that's not required to be held in, in open in, in the public. So when does an advisory board require to be meeting outside of the, in the shade? I'm trying to think of a, a situation. I can't I think have of never, a scenario. So we need to really strike that because I don't want them thinking that they can meet outside of, of the sunshine laws. All right. We um, can't. Yeah, exactly. Well, we can, but yeah. there are certain procedures, procedures but right, the only right. time we do that is on very rare occasions. They're, they're recommending, they're recommending being they're things to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's been a couple of situations where board mem boards have made uh, requests of the commission. Uh, those requests seem to kind of sit in the back burner um, in the past. And I would really like to see a provision for when they have a request of the commission, a separate policy on how that request is handled so they don't get lost again. That is actually being covered in another policy as well. What other policy is that? <laughs> we have, well, we're having, um, we're doing the staff liaison training. In the policy, it has um, for, actually, one second. No, it's not in this one. It'll have the um, 
we have what the staff liaison responsibility is. We're going to have the board ha advisory board handbook that's going to come before you for approval. We'll have that in there as well. And those are just procedures on how they request something through their staff liaison. It goes to a memo to their respective charter officer and then to the commission. That but shouldn't way. that be in here so the <coughs> advisory board members know that there's a procedure for that? <laughs> a policy covers the procedure. But shouldn't the advisory board members know there's a policy or procedure or whatever you want to call that it? That is up to your staff to provide those, and I guarantee our advisory boards are going to get them. It will be in their advisory board handbook that you, you're going to approve. That is part of their onboarding right. packet. Um, I think that covers all of it, but don't forget, Mayor, I do have, oh, there's one more. Um, in letter C, I missed it because we skipped over the unilaterally when we went to somebody else, I missed it. Um, when the report is provided to the commission, um, the board will give a verbal or a written report to the commission, but if the commission, the city commission will review the annual report and if necessary, meet with the boards to address the issue. So the city commission, if we receive a written annual report, let's say if I have an issue and I have a question and a concern, I'm supposed to go meet with the boards to address that issue? This is not just for the, uh, the, for the annual report that's provided to commission. This would also cover the duties and responsibilities and goals of the boards that they set in there. And if necessary, then we meet with the boards to address, we can have a joint meeting with them. It's not just the advisory board saying, we want a joint meeting to present these, but also gives the commission the opportunity to request a joint meeting to review them with them as well if they feel they need to. Sue was saying that one, no, we lost you. Thank you. I'm going to move on. I know you have some consensuses, Commissioner, but I, I want to see what the other commissioners have to say before we entertain those. Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, I'm going back to that 3-2 nonsense <laughs> again. Um, Good. If, if you had... The, how, how, how often do they meet? Do they meet every single month, each board? Most of them do. Planning meets twice a month, obviously, but most of the other ones meet generally once a month. Because by the time I got up to those five offices, I could have missed half a year of the meetings. Mm -hmm. So where I'm getting at is if you have three unexcused absences, that should be it. Okay. Now, if you're allowed... One excuse, because I know it's hard getting doctor's appointments down here, and it could be, you know, in the middle of the season, it takes you three months to get an appointment to get in, and it just happens to fall on your meeting date. You're allowed one, okay, excuse me. But after that, it should be done, because you are making a commitment. So I, I think it should be less rather than more. Okay. That's just my opinion. So that's all I had. I just had to get that out before I went nuts. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Commissioner Vice Mayor. Yes, I, I agree. I think it actually should be down to three. Yeah, I'm really taking a hard stand. Of any type? Uh, of any type. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Commissioner Stokes said, you uh, lose the effectiveness of having that board member if they're not there for more than half, half the time. So um, they're going to make a commitment then that should be it. I think, you know, after three, that that's it. They're not, they probably found this isn't working for them. And the other thing is uh, the three-year term, I do like the three-year term, um, to be honest with you, because we've had boards, I'm not sure if it's the historical board or people that wanted to continue to serve on that. There was nobody to take their place. I think the two-year comes into play when you have a lot of people clamoring to be on an advisory board and you want to be sure people have an opportunity to have their say. But when you don't and you can't meet because you have two people or even have to dissolve, you're kind of defeating the purpose of having an advisory board. So I, I like the three-year term. And if they decide they don't want to be on it for three years, they can resign, resign. correct? And then, okay, then at least that application, we can have, there's a vacancy. But when people say there's no vacancies, but that board is saying, 
but people don't show up, it really is frustrating. Mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions on the board. Commissioner McDowell, would you like to run with some consensuses? Based on the conversation I'm hearing, um, I've got three. If there's others that I may have missed, feel free to make, make your own. Um, the first consensus is to remove um, the second sentence in section 4.4A3, which is the chairperson is also authorized to call or schedule a special meeting or workshop unilaterally. So I'm assuming, Commissioner, you are a no. I'm a yes. I you, want that removed. Want, oh, you want it removed. I was, yeah, yeah, to remove, to remove that it. sentence. Commissioner Stokes. I'm a no on that one. I'm a no on that one. I'm sorry. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead. I'll make a motion <laughs> to remove the second sentence in Section 4.4A3, deleting the chairperson is also authorized to call or schedule a special meeting or workshop unilaterally. We have a motion on the floor to remove the second sentence in section 4.4A3. Do I have that right, Commissioner? Um, um, and to, to remove the chairperson's authority to unilaterally call a special meeting or a workshop. Do I hear a second? I'm not hearing a second. That motion fails for lack of a second. Keep going, though. You're on a roll, Commissioner. Um, I make a, 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 I'd like to get a consensus that the absences are no more than three absences each year, regardless of excused or unexcused. So, Commissioner Stokes? Or I agree with that one. Yeah, I agree with that one as well. Yes, Thanks, Mayor. I agree. Commissioner Emmerich. You got it, ma'am. Yes. Okay. We have a consensus to change the number of absences to a maximum of three of any type. Uh, the last consensus I have is a meeting that is oh, to remove uh, section D uh, 4.4 D. I'm sorry, E to E, like Edward, to a meeting that is exempt from Florida State Statutes 2.286, which is basically the shade meeting. So you are a yes to remove it? Yes, I am. I am a yes to remove it. I am a yes to remove it. Yes. Vice Mayor, Commissioner Emmerich. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mayor, if I may. No, can, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Can I ask the board why would they give the chairperson of an advisory board powers above and beyond what a commissioner can do by unilaterally calling a meeting without their board's consent or input? I, I, I'm just trying to understand and wrap my head around that one. So if I, if I may. I'll speak to it. The reason I voted the way I did or, or my position was the way it was on this is because I'm afraid that it unduly delays. It would require going to another meeting mm -hmm. to vote to have another a special meeting. It just seems to me that they still have to coordinate it with the other members of the advisory board. So that's why I didn't see it as a big issue. I just thought it had expedite the process. Otherwise, it would drag it on. And there may well be a need for a meeting. And again, it can't take place unless everybody else agrees to it. So I didn't see the problem, you know, instead of having to wait for that next scheduled meeting. So, I mean, I don't know. If I, I would say that. similarly yeah. responsiveness and, and flexibility, mm -hmm. Vice well, Mayor. Re reason I voted that way was because unknown circumstances, <coughs> emergencies arise, this, that, and the other. We cannot predict that in the future, mm -hmm. and it may be needed. If it's not used, it's not used. Right. But it well, may be a tool that could everybody. be used in the future, and that's why I looked at it, keeping it still in the box. So I, I appreciate the input. I just was concerned with hearing the absences. If somebody can't attend, they automatically have an absence now. So I, I just appreciate the feedback. Thank you. 
Okay. That's all the consensus is I have, Mayor. Um, if anybody Does anyone else, else have any changes they would like a consensus on? Check my notes. Bond. <laughs> I'll make a motion then, Mayor, if there's no other Hang on, concern. I see some people poking through their notes. We'll, oh, we'll give them thank a you. few more seconds, including myself. We're keeping the term to three years, right? Do we do anything yes. with so that? That's no okay. change, so okay. we don't have to do anything with that. Yeah, because it's already in the it's already document. in there. Okay, thanks. Okay, are we all set? Yeah. Okay, motion, please. I'll make a motion to continue ordinance number 2023 0 second. 07 to the second reading on February 14th with the two consensuses approved by the board. I second it. Okay, anything to that? Then let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you, City Clerk. Good conversation. Um, we've been at it for about an hour and 40 minutes. I'm going to suggest a 15-minute break. Uh, we will come back at, I have a hard time with math, one, two, three, at five of eight. Don't forget to don't forget to scoop. Why do we flood? During significant rain events, Northport nearly always floods in certain areas of the city. This is thanks to the locally named Myakkahatchee Creek, also known as the Big Slough Watershed. The 195 square mile drainage area flows through DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties, then through our city to exit at Charlotte Harbor. As the city of Northport is located at the low end of the Big Slough Watershed drainage system, the city's current flooding and water quality conditions are attributed not only to the city's growth, but also to upstream runoff in the DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota County portions of the Big Slough. During significant rain events, ponding can also occur. Ponding occurs in low-lying areas that are characterized by poorly drained or supersaturated soils. With back-to-back -back rainfall events, the ground is totally saturated, which increases the runoff during a storm. The city works hard to maintain its stormwater conveyance system, which is comprised of roadside swales draining into 79 miles of named waterways and 132 miles of retention ditches that interconnect with each other and with the Myakkahatchee Creek. There are 64 water control structures, of which 23 are gated water control structures, 5 are gated drop structures, 28 are fixed weir structures, and 8 are drop structures. The control elevations of these structures are designed so that water is retained in the waterways in a step-down elevation system configuration. This means the water levels in the waterway segments between structures progressively decrease in elevation from north to south and from east to west. This system configuration allows both retention of stormwater runoff for water quality treatment and storage for potable water use. In preparation for a storm, the gates are opened as needed to convey floodwaters. The city has an ongoing program to inspect and replace old corroded structures. Since 2006, 13 of the high-priority structures have been replaced or rehabilitated. The city also has a program to clear the ditches of sediment deposits that have accumulated over time and clear fallen trees and debris in the Myakkahatchee Creek. This also helps restore the flow capacity of the waterways. Long story short, Northport is prone to flooding, but the city works hard to maintain conveyance channels, water control structures, and procedures put in place to lessen the impact. When there is a hurricane or significant rain event, 
the city gets into response and recovery mode quickly after. Please stay safe out there.
This is George, your city arborist for the city of Northport. Today, we're gonna to discuss the tree permit. I get a lot of calls about the tree permit. A lot of people are confused on how to fill it out. Um, so I'm just gonna do a quick overview of the tree permit. Uh, people ask me, why do we need a tree permit? Uh, we are 21 years in a row, tree city. Um, we try to maintain our tree canopy. We have a 35% canopy requirement that is in the ULDC code. Uh, tree permit is $18.75. If you're caught cutting down a tree and do not obtain a permit, you will be fined $250. The tree permit is good for a year. Um, at the top left-hand corner of the permit, there is an, it says inspections. There's a phone number. Please call that number. It's an automated system uh, that will set up a final inspection for the inspector to come out and close out the permit. Please have the permit posted somewhere uh, when the tree work is being done and at the final inspection. If the paperwork is not where the inspector can find it, uh, they will fail the inspection. You can drop off your permit at City Hall. While it must be dropped off, you cannot email it in. Um, there's a drop box for small permits or the drive through window. been another video of Ask the Arborist. If you have any questions, please visit the city website at cityofnorthport.com. If you're happy and you know it, flap your wings. If you're happy and you know it, flap your wings. If you're happy and you know it, you really ought to show it. If you're happy and you know it, flap your wings. When you're following behind large trucks, you want to make sure that you're following at a safe distance. And if you don't know that safe distance, just remember if they if you can't see their mirrors, they can't see you. We stop at about a thousand houses a day. In order for us to complete that, you know, and, and be safe, you know, we try not to rush in between the houses. It takes us a little time. We're not trying to slow you down. We're just trying to get things up in an orderly fashion. How our trucks work, we have two different types of trucks that pick up uh, residential garbage and recycle. We have one that's a side loader and we have one that's a front loader. When that bucket comes out of the top of the truck and is positioned to pick up cans up front, you have probably eight, nine feet in front of you that the people behind you passing may not know about. On a large truck, construction vehicles, et cetera, there's a lot of flashing lights. So just make sure their brake lights, you know, you're paying attention to their brake lights and their blinkers so you know what they're intending to do. So you wanna make sure that you're not on a double yellow line or a curve and you have good visibility for oncoming traffic so you can pass safely. If you're too close and you go to pass, you never know what's around the corner. When coming up to an intersection behind a large vehicle, realize that you can't pass within 100 foot of an intersection. Go through that intersection safely, following at a safe distance, and then once your lines allow you to pass, do so safely when there's not oncoming traffic. Safety first. Don't risk your life to get somewhere sooner. All right, you're gonna hurt yourself or somebody else. Let's just keep it safe.
Hello, I'm David, and today we're doing another episode of Ask the Arborist. We've had a lot of questions come in about gopher tortoises in the city of Northport. We certainly have a lot of them, and today we're going to answer some of those questions that have been coming in. The first one is, what happens when there's a gopher tortoise on a vacant lot and a builder puts in a land clearing permit and wants to build or develop that lot? Well, when they submit a land clearing permit, myself or George Murphy, the other arborist, we go out to the land and we walk the lot for gopher tortoise burrows. This is what they look like. Um, the gopher tortoise is a keystone species and up to 300 diff 350 different animals depend on this burrow. So the state or the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has protected the plant. It is 7.55 and we are resuming city commission regular meeting. Your audio, ma'am. Again. Thank you so much. Uh, it is 7.55 and we are resuming our Northport City Commission regular meeting. I've had a request. We have several folks here um, for item K, which is a quasi-judicial item, and they have asked if we would move that up um, and hear them now and oh. shift everything else down. Does anyone have any opposition? to our reordering oh, geez, what, the I agenda. would have suggested that a long time ago. <laughs> I didn't realize that, that. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Okay, so I'm hearing happy sounds from everyone. Mm -hmm. Commissioner mm -hmm. Emmerich, sure motion. Yeah, I got no problems with that, yeah. absolutely. But we don't if everyone agrees. Just making sure. Um, okay, so we are going to start with item K, ordinance number 2023-06, 20, and this is a quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, would you read the ordinance by title only and swear in all of those wishing to give testimony? Ordinance number 2023-06, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Section 55-19, regarding Heron Creek Activity Center Number 2, amending the pattern book for the development of Town Center, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God? Thank you. Great. Have we had any ex parte communications? Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor? No. I'm a no. Commissioner Stokes? I'm a no. Commissioner McDowell? No, not since first reading. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties for this item? Yeah. Then we are on to presentations. Applicant, you go first. You have 20 minutes. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the Commission. For the record, Jeffrey Boone and the Boone Law Firm representing the applicant. I have, filled, uh, I have been sworn. Uh, we made our presentation uh, at the first reading, and so we have nothing further. Nothing has changed, and we have nothing further tonight. Uh, again, would respectfully request your uh, approval, and we'd be happy to answer any questions at whatever the appropriate time is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Staff, you're next. Good evening again. Noah Fawcett, Planning and Zoning Division. I have been sworn. During the first reading, the commission requested additional information pertaining to the responsibility to install the signal at White Ivis Drive and Sumter Boulevard intersection. <laughs> According to condition 5A of the development order, which was provided in the backup material of the Heron Creek DRI, the installation of the signal would be the responsibility of the developer should a traffic study related to a particular development show the need for the signal. However, if the signal were determined to be necessary by city staff separate from any particular site development, the signal would be installed by the city. Uh, and staff would recommend approval of ordinance number 2023-06. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fosick. Any rebuttal, Mr. Boone? Uh, no, ma'am. No, no rebuttal. Great. Thank you, Mr. Fosick. Uh, no rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. City Clerk, do we have any online public comment on this item? Yeah. I don't see any in-house. So at this point, I'm opening the floor to Commissioner questions. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am grateful to staff and the applicant for addressing my concern about the traffic signal at White Ibis. Um, the information provided was quite helpful in understanding the 
who the responsible parties are and when. Um, I do have two follow-up quick questions. During the first reading, I asked about the drinking fountain. I probably incorrectly assumed that that would be looked at and addressed for second reading. Um, I am wondering if anybody is planning to remove the requirement for the drinking fountain. Uh, it's 2.8.3.6. It says uh, it's, it's required as part of site furniture. It wasn't removed between first and second reading. If you'll recall, I brought up concerns about safety, sanitation, that kind of stuff. So a drinking fountain isn't required. However, what you're seeing is should a drinking fountain be provided, this is the style that must be provided. Um, drinking fountains aren't uh, required per code or this pattern book to be provided. However, again, if they are provided, they would have to match the style that's listed in this pattern book. But well, we hopefully, I hope they're not gonna be required to provide that kind of a drinking fountain. <laughs> um, moving on to section 2.3.10, um, I mentioned about a grammar error. I also see that that wasn't corrected. Um, small, small potatoes in the bigger scheme of things. I'm just wondering if it was even looked at. So, Mayor, with that, I conclude my questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm not seeing anything else, so we will move on to closing arguments. Mr. Fawcett. Staff would just recommend approval of Ordinance 2023-06, and there are no further arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boone. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Jeffrey Boone. Uh, uh, no, no argument. Just in closing, again, respectfully request approval of the ordinance. And thank you. Thank you. Um, so I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. Make, I'll make a motion. I move to adopt ordinance number 2023-06 as presented. Do I hear a second? Was that you, Commissioner McDowell? It was. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to adopt ordinance number 2023-06 as presented. Motion was made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner <clears throat> McDowell. If there's nothing more to that, and I'm not seeing anything more, let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Thanks Thank for staying with much. us. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go back. Up, up, up. Okay, ordinance second readings, ordinance number 202231. City Clerk, would you read this by title only? Ordinance number 2022-31, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the City of Northport Comprehensive Plan, adopting a new Chapter 13 coastal management element, including goals, objectives, and policies, and adopting a coastal management map series, amending Chapter 5, conservation and coastal zone management element, and adopting a conservation map series, amending the table of contents, amending Chapter 2, future land use element, amending Chapter 4, utilities element, amending nine public school facilities element, repealing conservation and coastal zone management maps five through one through five through 17, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for transmittal of documents, providing for conflicts, providing for severability and providing an effective date. Thank you, city clerk, city manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this item is amending the conservation and coastal code management element, renaming the element to coastal management element and creating a separate conservation element. Um, myself and staff are happy to answer <coughs> questions. Thank you, sir. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Not seeing any city clerk. Do we have any online public comment? I don't have any in house. So I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. 
I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Commissioner. Move to adopt ordinance number 2022-31 as presented. Do I Second. Have a second, Commissioner Emmerich. We have a motion on the floor to adopt ordinance number 2022-31 as presented, made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, gentlemen? Then let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Ordinance number 2023-01. City Clerk, would you read this by title only, please? Ordinance number 2023-01, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, adopting the fiscal year 2022 to fiscal year 2026 five-year schedule of capital improvements of the capital improvements element of the Northport Comprehensive Plan, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is the second reading of the ordinance adopting the five-year schedule of the capital improvement in the capital elements, um, excuse me, capital improvement elements of the North Fork Comp Plan. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you or the commission may have. Thank you, sir. I'm opening up the floor to commissioner questions. Not seeing any. Um, City Clerk, do we have any online public comment? We have none in house. So I am going to close this public hearing and request a motion. Make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll make a motion to approve ordinance number 2023-01 as presented. Do I hear a second? Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Emmerich. We have a motion on the floor to adopt ordinance number 2023-01 made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Do we have anything more to that? Let's vote. Mayor? Yes. Oh, oh, it came up. What? It was yeah. lagging. Oh. oh. Uh, and that motion passes five to zero. Yeah, it's, it's been a little sluggish. You've come up last a number of times, Commissioner McDowell. Okay, moving on. Ordinance number 2023-02. City Clerk, would you read this by title only, please? Ordinance number 2023-02, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code regarding unified control requirements and related definitions by amending sections 37-6, 37-7, 53-117, 53-205, 53-220, 53-240, 54-3, .3, and 61-3, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. City Manager, this is back to you. Thank you, ma'am. This is the second reading of the ordinance amending the ULDC to remove unified control requirements and amend certain definitions. Uh, myself and staff are here to answer any questions you or the commission may have. Thank you, sir. I'm opening up the floor to Commissioner questions. First in the queue, Commissioner McDowell. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start off by first thanking staff for the questions that I submitted prior to first reading and received the answers to at first reading. Um, I have had a chance to review them. I do have two outstanding questions I need a little bit more clarity on, if I may. Uh, the first one is in regards to line 193, section 61.3. It's a definition of a duplex. Staff stated that they are removing the definition of a duplex um, because I don't quite understand why. <laughs> and that's why I'm double checking because a duplex is under single ownership. They said something about a condo. Um, a condo is more of multifamily, not a duplex. I've never seen a condo be two units. I see Ms. Barnes coming down with her laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori Barnes, Planning and Zoning Manager. Um, staff's, staff's opinion as to the definition of duplex is this. Um, duplexes are single family attached. They are single family attached like a villa may be. Um, the city's involvement in ownership of a structure and whether it is fee simple 
or sold as a condominium unit um, is not, in our opinion, relevant to the Unified Land Development Code regulations and um, is an unnecessary restriction on private property rights. Yeah. Go ahead. Follow up then. If And I understand where you're going with that. <clears throat> but why then didn't we change the definition of multifamily? Because it says maybe individually owned or leased or and under common or single ownership. And then why didn't we change the definition of a villa, which says it's under separate ownership? So if we're going with that for a duplex, why are we not carrying that thought process in the other areas of dwelling units? Uh, we can certainly take a look at that at the uh, full ULDC rewrite. Um, this amendment was to focus on cleaning up the unified control requirements and those associated definitions. Um, if the commission as a whole feels that we should address those definitions now and bring this back for a third reading, then we're certainly willing to do so. All right. I, I just have a follow-up question to yours, Commissioner McDowell. So just so that I understand, the only difference between a villa and a duplex is a villa is separate ownership and a duplex is single ownership. Otherwise, they're virtually identical. Do I understand that correctly? Correct, correct. Okay. And, you know, if my memory <clears throat> serves me correctly, in the rewrite, we're really looking to address single family detached versus single family attached and not necessarily address these specific product types, as it were. A villa can still be single family attached. A duplex can still be a two story dwelling unit. So they are very, very similar in nature. I thought I had it, now I'm confused again. <laughs> but a villa is, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. A villa, the difference between a duplex and a villa is a duplex is single mm -hmm. ownership with two side by side, side by side, com one common wall. A villa is two separate properties under one roof with a common wall. Okay. So I'm I'm failing to understand why would we remove this and why is this all of a sudden a big Okay. Hopefully I can explain this in, in a way that's understandable. Um, a duplex generally is on one fee simple parcel of land. And for city regulations to state that the entire duplex has to be under one ownership prevents an individual from selling the unit as a condo. In other words, sell the structure, but not the land underneath on a separate lot. But a condo is owned by two separate people. Back to the villa. Back to the villa. The villa definition is but on separately owned lots. A on a condominium, the ground is under common ownership and the units are individually owned. That's I get it. what a villa is. A villa is, is a single freestanding conventional structure on two separately owned lots designed for two attached dwelling units. And you really want to remove the definitions of all of these things? That seems very counterproductive. Because people think duplex and villas and condos and have different pictures in each individual mind and removing that, defini that definition from the code just seems really opening up a Pandora's box without having it absolutely defined. <coughs> that kind of makes me nervous. Respectfully, a conversation for a different day. I, and the I definition you, of single family attached would include all of those different product types. Um, but, when, when this is addressed through the ULDC workshops. 
And, and I agree with you. This is a conversation for another day. So maybe we need to keep this until we have that conversation for another day. <coughs> That's where I'm headed for that. Um, but we'll see if we can get a consensus or add it to the motion. Um, my follow-up is similar vein is PCD. Um, you, your recommendation or the ordinance's recommendation is to remove the definition of a PCD. And the explanation was because it is um, synonymous with a planned unit development. I looked in the ULDC and I did not see a planned unit development anywhere in the ULDC. Are we changing the common terminology of PCD to a PUD now? Is that what is going to be happening during the ULDC rewrite? Uh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Um, PCD and the ULDC rewrite will no longer be a zoning district. Um, and yes, PCD, a planned community development, is synonymous with a planned unit development. Those are defined in the Florida statutes. So, because, and it's kind of along the same veins, until we have the ULDC rewrite complete, maybe we need to keep this definition because PUD is not in our ULDC as it is. I understand it's in state statute, but this is our ULDC collectively ours. And it, 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 it concerns me to remove definitions while we are still in the process of rewriting the ULDC when it can very easily be done at ULDC rewrite time. That's where I'm going with it. If I may, Ms. Barnes, what's, what's the downside, if any, of you know, following Commissioner McDowell's suggestion that we just sort of keep what we have for now and then make all the changes in context at ULDC read right. Is there a downside to us? Well, I can tell you that um, PCD is thoroughly and completely described in Chapter 53, Article 8. Um, and again, it's defined in the Florida statutes that at, um, as planned unit development. So the definition in Chapter 61, in our opinion, is redundant. Do I think there's any harm in leaving it um, until the full ULDC rewrite? Um, no. Mayor, may I get a consensus to leave the definition of duplex in until future conversations? Okay, so obviously you're a yes to leave the definition of duplex in. How about you, Commissioner Stokes? I'm fine with it. I don't think it matters either way. I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Okay. Um, I tend to agree. I don't think it's a material issue. Um, we'll revisit it again mm -hmm. yeah. um, at ULDC rewrite. Vice Mayor? Yes. It's fine. So take it out for now. Okay. Yep. To leave it in, leave the definition in. in. To leave, leave the definition in. in. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm saying okay. leave it in for now. Okay. Thank you very much. And then the second one is along the similar veins is to leave the definition of the PCD in this. Um, in the ULDC to not remove it as being requested in the second reading um, and to readdress it during the ULDC rewrite. Okay. So I am also good with that. Yeah, as am I, leave the definition of PCD in until ULDC rewrite, yes. Vice Mayor, yes. Commissioner yes. Emmerich. Okay. Okay. All right. This next one is a question more for trying to understand process. Um, we have been trying to rewrite the ULDC for many years, it's no secret. During these past few years, there have been a couple of times where it's been suggested that we address it during ULDC rewrite. Hey, we'll talk about this during ULDC rewrite. This will come back during ULDC rewrite. Over and over and over again, some of the issues are very 
important to get done in a very timely fashion, um, sooner rather than later, many, many times. Um, the first one that comes to mind is the um, housing, affordable housing <clears throat> incentives, those kind of things to get done. Unified control is like a non-issue. How did this unified control jump to the top of the list when we've had so many other things kind of sitting, waiting for ULDC rewrite to be complete? Um, unified control came to the attention of the department um, through a legal review and the requirements of unified control and the definition of unified control would hamper an applicant's ability to apply for a development petition approval for property that was under joint ownership, um, a, a combination of a parcel of several parcels of land that were under different ownership. So not addressing the unified control issue was creating a situation where certain development petitions may not be able to proceed under the current regulation. They could always ask for a waiver from the code. Mm. Um, modifications, modifications under the ULDC are limited to certain sections of the code. Um, and I'm not certain that uh, chapter 61 definitions um, is under the modification section um, wherein an applicant could ask for a modification to the regulations. If, excuse me, if I may contribute to the discussion. Um, sorry. <clears throat> I, I agree with um, Ms. Barnes with respect to the commission's authority. You, you do not have carte blanche authority to waive regulations that are codified in the Unified Land Development Code. Moreover, the reason we did begin to discuss this between the city attorney's office and the planning and zoning division is because there were procedural issues here. You know, <clears throat> unified control is not a term of art. It's something that we find in this code, and we don't really find it anywhere else. Um, but in, in discussing this with the planning and zoning division, we found that they were already addressing really the, the legal question at issue, which is, does the applicant, you know, provide proof of the ownership of the property? And that's really what the city needs to determine the petition on that topic. So this issue of unified control is something that um, I think was created by whoever drafted the language in the code. We found it in different places. The procedure was inconsistent. It was um, not only inconsistent in the procedure itself, but it was inconsistent in the types of um, applications for which it was required. And to, to be frank, the city had not been, been following the procedure that was in the ULDC. Thank you for that explanation. Um, that's all I have, Mayor. If there's no other questions, whenever you're ready, I'll be happy to make a motion. I'm not seeing any other questions, so go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve ordinance number 202302, keeping the two consensuses that were approved relating to um, duplex and planned community development in the ULDC ordinance. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell to um, adopt ordinance 2023-02, keeping the two consensuses um, that were made here this evening. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Emrich. Anything to that? Let's vote. Thank you for the discussion, everyone. I'm more than welcome. And that motion passes five to zero. Moving on to ordinance number 2023-03. City Clerk, would you read this by title only, please? Ordinance number 2023-03, an ordinance of the city of Northport adopting city commission policy number 2023-01 related to the inventory disposal and acquisition of real property, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. City manager, this is your item. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. This is the second reading 
uh, that we request of the property and finding of uh, uh, the commission policy. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, sir. I'm opening the floor to commission questions. I am not seeing any. Oh, Commissioner McDowell. It's still kind of laggy. Um, I just have a couple, um, especially since uh, city attorney had kind of weighed in on some of the things. Thank you for that. It eliminated a lot of them. Um, if you go to the proceeds of sale, it's number three on page three. It says the proceeds of the sale of surplus properties will be allocated pursuant to commission direction, which basically is making the next sentence ir irrelevant. The next sentence says, in the absence of the direction, the sale proceeds will be allocated to the general fund, blah, blah, blah. Um, if the city commission has to approve the sale of property, we can give direction on how those proceeds would be spent at that same time. So there would be no absence of direction. Um, or once the proceeds come in, city manager or whoever would put it on the agenda to get that direction. So I just wanted to get a better understanding as to why that second sentence still remains. From lack of um, any other discussion on this, it was just to make sure that we had all of our bases covered. Um, it's a little bit redundant, but I don't think it's problematic. Well, again, these, these kind of policies and codes survive all of us. And my fear is that, hey, we're going to forget to get commission direction. And then it automatically goes into the general fund to be forgotten about almost forever. So I, I would be more inclined to see about removing that sentence. That way then we get the commission's direction. And to be clear, it does also state that it would go back to the applicable right. special district fund as yeah. well. So if it came from road and drainage, it would go back. But maybe. There's a, there's a lot of scenarios that that money could be used for, um, especially if it's general fund or for any of the special districts. But this is a commission decision, and that's why I'm looking to see, Mayor, if we can get a consensus to remove that redundant second sentence. Commissioner Stokes? Yeah, I would go along with that. <clears throat> As would I, Vice Mayor. I'm sorry, could you tell me where, what you're referring to again, Commissioner McDowell? Um, where is number it? Number three, proceeds of sale. Since the surplus will be allocated pursuant to commission's direction, that second sentence is basically redundant and irrelevant, so I'm asking to have it removed by consensus. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. I'm a yes. So okay, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, there's just a couple more. Um, if you go to page four, it is under the exchange of real property, the number three. It says the landowner of the acquired parcel will be responsible for all costs associated with the sale. I had to read that like five times, and I don't know if it was because it was late in the day or early in the morning or coffee hadn't kicked in, but I kept reading it going, who's paying for the proceeds? <laughs> who's paying for this? Can't we just say, is it the seller or the purchaser of the property is paying for these costs? It would make it so much more clear. So this covers it if it's a donation, if it's... Um, mm -hmm. It broadens it by calling it that. So this is the land exchange portion. Correct. So they're not technically selling it, they're exchanging it. So if you okay. say it's a seller, then um, you're, you're not really aligning with the action taking place. So is it the original owner that is paying for the costs or is it the future? Or is each party paying their own costs. That would probably be the simplest way to do it. During previous conversation, it was um, direction to make sure that the city was not paying those costs and that the cost would be borne by others. So at this point, it says that the landowner of the 
acquired parcel will be responsible for the costs associated with the sale. So an exchange. So what? A transaction. Um, open for second. If it's an even exchange. It may not always be an even exchange. But w where I'm headed with this is to determine which party. Because you're not acquiring a parcel, you're switching, you're like you even said, you're exchanging. It may be even exchange, maybe not. But who ultimately is paying for this in this regard? And being that this is um, a city of Northport policy, it's, it's writing about how we're acting. So um, for our standpoint, the landowner that we're acquiring the parcel from would be managing those costs. I'm, I'm still at a loss, guys. Maybe city attorney or somebody else can help me because if you have a parcel and I have a parcel, and just to keep it simple, <clears throat> we're going to swap it. Who's paying the costs? So previous version was the landowner of the parcel being acquired by the city will be responsible for all the costs associated with the sale. That it still didn't make any sense. It was on my notes from before trying to, and I didn't ask it the first time. City attorney or a city manager, might you have another way of describing it that would help clarify? Or maybe another commissioner? I guess I would, I guess I would ask because it's an issue for for the board. Right. I'm just, that's where I was going too. As I've written, it's clear to me, but also I, I may have written it, so that might be <laughs> So if I can understand if, if it's an right. issue for the, the board at large and we can understand maybe a little more, then perhaps we can figure out how to tweak the language. Commissioner Stokes. Um, for this issue, do we care which party pays as long as it's not the city? If I understood what we were trying to say mm -hmm. here is we're trying to say the city will not be responsible. That's how the parties decide who would pay That's for this the is between them, as long as it's not the city, you know, or am I missing something? Is that a better way to describe it? But the city will not be responsible for the parking right. costs or yes. the fees associated that with the certainly help. That, that is thank definitely you. much clearer. Okay. okay. Now that's scary thought. <laughs> Can we get a consensus? Uh, unless anybody else wants to weigh in. Do we need one? We're changing language yeah. and we have yeah. to approve an ordinance okay, here in I'm a minute. I'm a nod from the city attorney. Um, oh, somebody else try it. You make try make it. your I'll census, make, Commissioner McDowell. I'll get a consensus. Um, thank you, Commissioner Stokes, for that language. Boy, that was amazing. Um, the city will not, be, um, in number three, the city will not be responsible for all costs associated with the transaction. How about any cost? Any, any cost. cost. Yes. And for, for clarity for the city clerk's minutes, that's in section three land exchange program or subsection. Okay, so Commissioner McDowell is a yes. Commissioner and Stokes? I'm good with that. I'm a yes. Yes. Vice Mayor, Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. We're there. And I change just for clarity for the city clerk, instead of the sale, I put the transaction because it's an exchange. Hang on one second. The last one I have is regarding the independent written appraisals. Um, it's in section E and it's requiring for the acquisition of real property. And it's saying that if the property is less than $100,000, there's no independent written appraisal. I, I, I take <clears throat> great pause at not requiring a written appraisal on whether we are buying the property or we are selling the property or we are exchanging the property. If you go back up to exchange, it says the city will not exchange property that is more than the market value. How are we going to know the market value unless we do an appraisal? And it doesn't matter. 
That appraisal needs to be done if it's a vacant lot valued at $2,000 or, or, or a, a lot that's valued at $100,000 We or $500,000. We have to protect our interests, and the only way to do that is through an independent appraisal. Beth, what's the thinking behind that? The thinking was to avoid additional costs with obtaining <coughs> an appraisal on each parcel. It was previous direction from the first time this policy came before the commission. And that's, <clears throat> that, that comes in part from the Florida statute section 166.045C, which you'll see referenced in this policy, and which is the reason why we're adopting this policy by ordinance when we usually adopt them by resolution. That statute provides when appraisals are required, but it also provides that to an extent that the city commission can modify that um, through a procedure by an ordinance and you know that we need to have that in place in order to take advantage of the of, of specific exemptions under public records and open meetings that are temporary um, you know for the duration of I think it's like negotiations or until a contract is entered something like that so that's sort of what prompted the inclusion at all in the, in the policy I, I just I like this policy, but we need to make sure we have a, an appraisal. What's the cost? It's of very an appraisal. It's cheap insurance to me. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. Um, I do not have the price of the appraisal in front of me. It's typically several thousand dollars for mm -hmm. appraisal. And it's in the parcel. Well, how would you determine the fair market value of a property that you're exchanging? Because if if it's not an even exchange, how do you determine the fair market value without an appraisal that we do to make sure our <coughs> interest is protected? Yeah, related. How do you know it's $100,000 or would less look, if you don't? We would look for searches of recent sales of similar type parcels to determine what the value the current going value is it wouldn't be an official appraisal we'd look at the attributes of the land um, the area around it look for similar sales but that's not in here this is specifically the, just talking about the appraisal portion, yeah portion. but that what you just said is not in here so are we looking for language that says that staff will do research to to establish develop, the value of a, value a property or, right, that we deem as $100,000 or less. And we could add that. That's, mm -hmm. We yeah. have a real estate coordinator that would do that research. I was just going to ask that if that's part. something. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would assume that that would be presented to the commission as part of the um, decision-making process. Absolutely. The, research, the, the documents that we would, we would provide those to commission. So, is what is that language that you're recommending, or is this something you guys can work on and we'll bring back for third reading? How do you want to proceed with this? Because this is a, a newer subject. Uh, we could add language in in lieu of appraisal, you know, for properties under $100,000 that uh, staff would develop an in house appraisal for the property based on existing properties. Respectfully, Mr. Speaker, I would not use the word appraisal here because mm -hmm. okay. we would not be able to conduct an appraisal. Market analysis, um, I think, is the phrase. Well, that's also sort of a term of art. So you have a couple of options here. You can, you know, by consensus or motion, direct the gist of what you want and let us wordsmith it for you and, a, and then approve it, and trusting that that wordsmith will happen. Or if you want more input in the wordsmithing, then you can continue it to third reading. But I do think that's something that we want to look at a little more carefully because of the statute that's implicated here and probably coordinate with the real estate coordinator on that language uh, before we finalize it. I would much prefer to have staff come back with recommended language, mm -hmm. but I think we're kind of talking, I think it's clear what the concern is and wanting a little bit more specificity on how we'll determine yep. the value of that property if we think yes, it's 100,000 or less, so. We'll have staff come back. I'll make a. Con I'll get a consensus then, um, just to make sure everybody's on board with it. To um, have staff present at third reading um, the language to 
incorporate some type of in-house analysis on the value of the property under a hundred thousand dollars. If I may, it's it's not clear to me that you want them to come back with recommended language for third reading. I said for yes, third reading. Yes, could you repeat it again? Then I just want to mm. make sure. Um, I can tell you what I have. A question oh, about thank you, that City helps. Clerk. Yeah, I kind of yeah. was slow on that. There was consensus to have staff present language to incorporate in-house analysis on property value under one hundred thousand dollars at third reading. That's the consensus. We haven't voted on that yet. Right, Commissioner Emmerich. I'm a little leery on this because of the fact is is. I don't know how, how conducive this is going to be on staff's time. Staff is not an expert in, you know, real estate markets. <clears throat> you know, when you do have an appraisal, it is factual. And it does cut out the middleman. It cuts out all the uh, backroom dealings per se. And it could be this is worth this, this is worth this, and you come to a conclusion on it. So I, I don't want to put that into staff's hand to come up with those numbers. I'd rather have it written in stone on a piece of paper saying, this is what this is worth, this is what this is worth, now let's negotiate. So you want a formal appraisal? Absolutely. And I, I that's where I was going with my initial questions, but I was looking for a little bit of a compromise. So seeing no consensus, I'll make a motion. Hmm. I'll make a motion that um, all property acquired or sold um, by the city will have a um, written market, independent written appraisal. Second. Oh, so you're not showing up on my screen, city attorney, but I'm watching your hands, so go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I, I want to, to um, ask for clarification on the motion because currently and the policy as written, we require two independent written appraisals if the purchase price exceeds 500,000. And I believe the intent of the motion is for anything that is less that we obtain one independent written appraisal. And I just want to get clarification of that on the record. Commissioner McDowell. Um, I will add, well, it's for all property. It doesn't matter if it's 100,000 or 500,000. And I think state statute requires two if it's over 500,000. Well, that's why I wanted to make sure it was clear in the minutes that your motion only goes to property that goes up to the price of five hundred thousand. At five hundred thousand, it requires not one but two, two. independent. All right, let me let me try this. Before we go too far, can you please um, clarify as to whether or not that includes donated parcels? Because at this point, we weren't requiring um, appraisals on donated parcels, but you've extended that to all parcels. I want to make sure that we're not requiring it on donated. How parcels. about we do it this way? My my intent is to have staff come back for a third reading because we've made a lot of very substantive changes here, especially with this one. My intent is to have an appraisal done for properties that are bought or sold or exchanged for the city or districts, regardless of the price. But then we got to add in state statute requirements and all that kind of stuff. So well, I believe I, what she's saying is if, if, if that property is being exchanged, whether it was donated, bought, or whatever, yes, there will be, because we need to know the value of that property for that exchange. Yes. If we are if we going to get a, rid of it. If we own a property, whether it came to us from donation or any other way, Correct. we would need an appraisal. But prior to an ex accepting a donation mm. for the first time, I don't believe no. we need an appraisal. Right, no. Okay. If we're getting rid of it, it's, yes. it's, yeah. it's buy, on the market. Yeah. Buy, acquire, or exchange, we need to have appraisal, a written appraisal. Commissioner Stokes. Not to throw a monkey wrench into this, but Go ahead. the $100,000 number, if we have a property that's of nominal value and we're looking at spending a couple of thousand dollars on an appraisal, does that make sense? Would we not want to take that $100,000 bar down to some reasonable level so that anything below it wouldn't make sense to go out and pay for an appraisal? 
you know, whether it's five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, I don't know that number necessarily, but it seems to me, while I'm all in on, we should have appraisals for properties. I would hate to see us have a nominal piece of property and spend virtually the entire value of that property to pay for appraisal. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And we're saying all, which means something even worth two, three, four thousand oh. dollars. And, and we would we would be willing to do that with ever whatever number of commissions comfortable with. Um, in the past, we have spent <laughs> close to the cost of a parcel for an appraisal. Um, that but, does bother us, but that's what what that the process is, has been. Yeah. But we also have to be able to identify what that who's going to make that determination. If you say it's twenty thousand, you know if that's the number. Who's going to that's say? Too. Are you guys going I'm, to trust and trust us with that, or you know, a real estate coordinator who's a professional in this business to to come up with that and say, okay, this one's close to that threshold. We're going to get an appraisal. I mean, we need that that bit of trust from from commission for you to, to set that bar. If you took something like ten thousand dollars or seventy five hundred dollars, you know, there anything below. I mean, I'm comfortable with trusting a staff professional. Anything more than that? No. I mean, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Maybe we can do a hybrid. And I'm sorry, man. I'm kind of out of out of sync here, but. If well, we did a hybrid, I was, I was actually thinking that we're paying for a real estate mm -hmm. coordinator on staff. I would like her to come back with a recommendation at third reading rather than us yeah. trying to figure it out here. <laughs> Why don't we let her do her job? Okay, so let's I ask just, for a little more direction. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Just a little. We haven't confused 20, you enough. Twenty-five thousand, and okay. she I'm might careful. come back and Very say good. it makes more sense at forty or at fifteen. So I don't want that number necessarily to be in stone, but as sort of general guidance. Ish, Ish. based on the market. You got it. Ish. Right. And and you all are doing this, but just to to prevent the conversation, the statute does state this governing body may by ordinary vote exempt the purchase in an amount of. One hundred thousand dollars or less from the requirement for an appraisal, so that's sort of where we got the hundred to start mm -hmm. with, right? right. You know, so we need to do hundred thousand or something below it, which is, is what you're discussing. Right. So maybe maybe the consensus is to direct staff to do a hybrid using the the real, real estate, estate coordinator. coordinator real estate coordinator to do an in-house. Analysis, thank you, for all properties under twenty five thousand ish, and a market written independent analysis for all sale, purchase, and exchange above that threshold ish. To the 500 mark. And then there's two requirements. In, in consideration of state statute requirements above the $100,000 requirement. I, 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 guys, I'm struggling here. I think we know the intent. I'm trying to put the intent in a consensus, and I know I'm struggling, but I think if they were to go back and listen to this, they would really hear we want a market analysis in writing for properties that we're buying, selling, or exchanging, but we also recognize we don't want to spend a lot of money for a market analysis written by an independent if the property is only valued at a hundred thousand at a thousand dollars at a thousand dollars. So, how do you put that in a consensus? I'm I'm doing the best I can, guys. Can I make a suggestion, Commissioner? Sure. If I'm understanding you correctly, I think what you're looking for is. You know, something like if the purchase price is X amount or less, then the city is exempt from obtaining an independent written appraisal, and the city staff will conduct an analysis, um, you know, related to the, the value of the property. And we can wordsmith that together. Um, I, I think I heard every everybody, yep. you know, kind of say, yes, we don't, we don't want you to just to bring it back with no analysis. We want to see some level of analysis conducted by our real estate coordinator. And then you all need to decide what that that numeric threshold mm -hmm. is. 
that you want um, to trigger the independent written appraisal. And may I ask if they could come up with the numbers on what an actual cost factor is, like per thousands or whatever, if it, if it deems different? You know, when, when you get an uh, appraisal over 100000 is it this much? If you get a $50,000 appraisal, is it this? Are there different cost factors involved? We will provide some background information. You know, a little chart the, type thing. If, if it's fluctuating, if it's just by property and it's going to be X, then that's what it is. But, I mean, that might help decide the factors on leniency on who's going to do what, you know, especially if we get into big numbers. That's my suggestion. Mayor, sorry. Yeah, um, we're brainstorming here, so that's okay. Do, do you want to take another shot? Actually, I'd like the attorney to say what she said as our consensus, <laughs> but I know that's probably yeah. not allowed. <laughs> well, I, I don't mind trying if you'd like, Commissioner. I think um, perhaps what the, the board is discussing is modifying this subset, amending this subsection um, E1. E to, you know, identify the dollar amount for when an independent written appraisal is not required, and then specifying that in those instances, the city staff will conduct an analysis as to the value of the property and present that to the commission at the time the commission uh, determines whether or not the purchase is approved. Uh, I had most of it. Let me take a shot. Go for it. Oh, pass the gavel, please. Well, we're just doing a consensus, right? Do, do I need to no. pass the gavel? Okay, I thought so. Um, modify subsection E1 to um, in, instruct staff to identify the dollar amount for when an external market analysis on a property is not required and an informal staff analysis will be conducted to establish a value for that property. If we could just tweak that where you say external market analysis to make sure the language is clear for the statute. Independent. It's an independent Pendent. written appraisal. Independent written appraisal. appraisal. Okay, do we all have that? Mm -hmm. Everyone good? Okay, Commissioner McDowell? I'm yes in theory. <laughs> um, yes. I'm a yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay. Is that clear enough? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And you'll bring it back at third reading. All right. Thank you. Okay. Those were my big questions that I had, and I'm really glad I prompted this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I don't know if anybody else had anything else. I don't want to. I'm not seeing any. No. So we are going to move on. Nope. We got to instruct the uh, make a motion. Oh. Okay. Oh, it was just a comment. Do we have to hear comments? Before? Not, um, yes, yes, we do. So I need to open it up for public comment. Do we have anything online, City Clerk? We do have one in-house, Justin Willis. Um, Justin Willis, as a realtor who does commercial and residential real estate, my brain has just exploded. The simple answer to your question is the cost that's inquired by both parties is the taxes on the property. The city would not be responsible for taxes because you guys don't pay taxes on your own lot. So it would be inquired by the person who is purchasing it or selling the lot to you because they would still be responsible or exchanging it to you. They would still be responsible for the taxes on that land. Um, second thing is it's called a comparative market analysis. It's done for free by your realtor. Your appraisal is done independently by an independent appraisal company, which is outside who uses a very specific standard. The CMA can be done by your realtor for free. You're going to end up hiring a realtor to put it on the MLS, if, and even in an exchange. So my question on that is who pays the commission on the sale of that? It's, it's the only real question that I have, but the easy answer is your realtor should be doing a CMA on the properties no matter what the price is, even to see if it's comparative with the uh, with the um, the appraisal that goes along with it. So, just to simplify the answer to those two questions. Sorry, I might have wanted to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. At this point, 
Um, I don't see anything else. I'm going to close this public hearing and request a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll McDowell. make a motion to instruct staff to make the three um, policy, the three consensuses that were discussed today and bring back ordinance number 202303 for a third reading for commission consideration. Do I hear a second? Second. We have a motion on the floor to instruct staff to bring ordinance number 2023-03 back for third reading, including the three changes um, that were approved by a consensus. Anything? As long as you have for a third reading back to commission. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a second on that? Yes. Okay, so the motion was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Let's vote. Boy, this is slow, the tally. And that motion passes five to zero. <clears throat> Moving right along to resolution number 2023-R-05, City Clerk, would you please read this by title only? Resolution number 2023-R-05, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the non-district budget for fiscal year 2022 to 2023 for costs related to Hurricane Ian and vehicle and drone requests from the police department in the amount of $3,560,528, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. City Manager, would you introduce this item, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. This budget amendment is, budget amendment is for non-district budget expenses related to Hurricane Ian, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. I am not seeing it. It's really lagging. Oh, Sorry. it's really lagging. Go ahead, Commissioner. Okay, so this is for a budget amendment. Um, you know, I, I I have to start before I make these questions because it's going to come off as I'm dissing on staff, and that is absolutely not my intent. I am very sympathetic to the employees that worked during the hurricane, before, during, and after. Um, and I, I definitely understand the toll that it takes on every one of them and their families. Um, but unfortunately, it's one of the downfalls of working for government and having the um, being required to report. I know when I worked for DOC, I was in required to report. Uh, when we were on lockdown, I couldn't leave. And I knew that when I took the job. I, I, I have to understand why are we paying the SS employees, which is described as salaried employees who were working when we were closed. Some of those were work days. They were working. So are they getting additional money? Are they getting paid for the day they worked and then paid again? Or working because City Hall was closed? City Manager, is there, oh, I think I see someone. Yes, while our finance team comes down, um, uh, Commissioner McDowell, where exactly in here in the amount that you're talking about? I didn't Which say amount? an amount. It's the SS employees under the, the, SS employees, it's $130,000 in the backup material. When I asked what an SS employee is, it was described as their salaried employees who worked while City Hall was closed between September 28th and October 4th. There were five working days in that time frame. Yes, and so I believe the answer to the question is that we pay them, and please I'll ask finance to come down and confirm, is because those expenses were eligible to be reimbursed through the process of us um, applying through FEMA. Am I right, Director? Um, and that was our goal to 
Kim Williams, the finance director. Yeah, that has been our policy. Um, not just now, but before right, this that's hurricane. that's always been our policy. And always yes, the, the, the policy. Right. So it's not a new policy. No. It's something that you've done in the past that we're asking you to continue in the present. Okay, so thank you for that clarity. Um, I don't ever remember a hurricane coming through that really would kick this to the level of a huge budget amendment. Um, so the policy is that if you're a salaried employee, and you report to work and City Hall is closed, you get paid for reporting to work and you get paid because City Hall was closed. Is that what I'm under, is that correct to some? Um, it, do you mean for the- Salaried employees, the SS employees. Closed for a natural emergency disaster. You just said closed, but again, the practice that this city has done in multiple or other occurrences is to pay that salary for those two employees prior to this one. We are continuing the practice that's already been in place. Okay, and, and I was unaware of this policy because when Hurricane Irma came through, I don't even think there was a budget amendment for that. So it, this conversation has not happened in the past. So that's why I was trying to understand they're getting paid twice. Once, because the hurricane came through, which caused, caused the city hall to be closed, and then they got paid for being at work. They're not being paid double time. Correct. That's the question. That I is think the, that's question. the question. They're not being paid the double question. time. Just getting paid once. Then why? Okay, if they're getting paid once, why are they? Why is this in the budget amendment when they're already budgeted in salary? So in, for. For these two codes, I, I believe there was a response this afternoon that we will be removing those two from the budget amendment. So that means the amount will go down by $151,060. Okay. So if you look in the detail spreadsheet, those top two lines, we were going to remove those on second reading because those are already in the regular budget. That okay. is correct. Okay, and my question is relating to the SS employees that are salaried. Okay. Why are they not being removed from this budget amendment? Because they're already salaried, it's already budgeted. Yeah, but then they were here for 24 hours, many of them. So they were, it's not budgeted to pay them for 24 hours. So salaried employees get paid overtime? No. In policy in a storm, yes. In emergency callback, yes. In emergency conditions, I don't know the right terms for it, they do get paid. Thank you for, for that overtime. understanding and explanation because it was not clear as mud then, and I appreciate the conversation on that, that makes um, sense. especially yeah. with policy yeah. that, yeah. that is already in place. Thank you for that. So if we are going to remove the SM and the SR employees from this budget amendment, as this memo back states, are we also addressing the FICA and FRS contributions because we are no longer paying the $151,000? Wouldn't we need to adjust, uh, adjust FICA down and, and adjust FRS down? Yes. Mm -hmm. At least so. The, the department who requested this in their funding didn't request for the rest, so I'm assuming they're going to absorb the uh, benefit costs. And they're only asking for the salary and overtime costs. This is just PD. All right. So they wouldn't have asked for FRS, and we have to pay FRS and FICA. Why wouldn't that have automatically been included? They didn't request it. I. And again, they could probably absorb it in their budget, or I'm sure we're going to have more amendments mm -hmm. for Ian yet to come, and we can look at it again. But for right now, they only requested the salary and the overtime costs. All right. Um, thank you very much, <clears throat> and I appreciate it. I just, I just wanted to understand the complexity of a policy that I'm ignorant to because we've never experienced something of this magnitude. And 
the, the revenues to pay for these budget amendments that are going to continuously come forward, we have to make sure that we're, we're, we're not using up money that we don't need to use up. And so I, I just appreciate the conversation on it and looking at it again. Thank you. There's going to be lots of budget amendments coming. I know mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Anything else on this item, commissioners? No. The, the only other question is when we make this motion, because it's only now the budget amendments only come back once, could you give me the final dollar amount that we need to adjust? Three million? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. I got to find Did you not think I had it ready? <laughs> Go ahead. Three million. You were Three million. $409,468. is the new budget amendment amount. Do we need to adjust any other numbers? Um, oh, fund balance, general fund, fund balance. What is that new number going to be? That one will be 2903217 Normally, I would get out my calculator to double check math, but I'm going gonna, gonna to let it go. I'm trying. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think you can just approve it with the the adjustment of taking out the two lines, right. the SM and the SR our codes. I think okay. better not to do the math and the motion. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. So we can. All right. Thank okay. you very much for the conversation, Mayor. Yep. I'll turn it back over to you. I'm, um, done. I'm not seeing anything else. So, City Clerk, do we have any online public comment for this item? We have none in-house, so I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I see a powwow going on. Do we want, can we wait to make sure there's nothing else that we need to address? Okay. Okay, he just told me, yes, I didn't know, I, I've missed that, yes, the FICA and the FRS are in there. So again, if you just say those two codes out and the adjustments to FICA and FRS. Oh, so they, they. It is in there. Yeah, it is in there. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I can make those adjustments when I take the other two out. Okay. All right. I'll make a motion to approve. Adopt. What's the difference between approve and adopt? It's the same thing, isn't it? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 2023R-05 with the removal of the category SM storm with pay and the removal of SR storm regular work hours and adjust FICA and FRS costs accordingly. Do I have a second? Do. I second. Uh, okay. So we have a motion to adopt resolution number 2023-R-05 removing SM storm with pay, SR storm regular work hours, and adjusting FICA and um, other taxes. FICA, FICA, FICA and FRS figures and, accordingly. And FRS accordingly. Motion made by Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Anything to that? Let's vote. That motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. City Clerk, keep me honest. I think we're on to general business. I didn't jump over anything. Yeah. Great. Um, item number 22-3783. Uh, City Manager, would you introduce this item, please? Yes. Madam Mayor. Um, Item 22-3783, this is discussion and possible actions regarding the presentation of a key to the city to Fred Towers, um, possibly at the City Commission regular meeting on February 2nd, 2023, requested by Mayor Barbara Langdon. 
Yeah, I'll just make a comment. I'm assuming that this item would be totally non-controversial. I think Fred has been a well-known leader um, in the city. He was a commissioner. He's volunteered on more nonprofit boards than I, I think I could even state in an hour and always gave of himself very freely um, to the people of the city. So I'm requesting that, that we approve this. Um, but are there any questions or comments from my fellow commissioners? Thanks for bringing it forward, Mayor. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, great, great. Do we have any public comment on this item online? And I don't see any in-house. So I'm requesting a motion. Mayor, may I suggest you pass the gavel and make the motion since it's your agenda item. <laughs> Here you go, Vice Mayor. Um, I move to approve the presentation of a key to the city to Fred Tower III posthumously at our February 2nd, 2023 city commission meeting. Second. Oh, uh, we have a motion on the floor. There you go. Thank you. All right, nothing else? Let's vote. You know you need to say what a it little, is. A little bit more. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And who made the first and yes. the second? Well, I don't think I, I. This is why it's important to pass the gavel so she learns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. Uh, we have a motion made by Mayor uh, Langdon for to approve the presentation of the key to the city to Fred Tower at the February 2nd, 2023 City Commission meeting. It was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Do I have that right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and if there's no further um, comments, anything to say, let's vote. Let's vote. Well done. And that Pass. motion. Oh. Yep, that motion passes five to zero. And thank, thank you, you. Mayor, for bringing that up. <laughs> and I just want to thank everyone for voting for that. I know that his um, widow, Lydia, will be delighted um, by this action. So thank you very much. Is she aware of it, or is it a surprise? Um, I did mention it to her. Um, ba -ba -ba. Let's move on to item 23 dash. 0201, approving regular meeting minutes. City Clerk, this is your item. Yes, there actually were no changes to these minutes. They were mistakenly put under general business and they should have been on consent. So okay. they can just be approved as is. Okay, so do you want, we need to go through the motion since yes. it's here? Okay, great, thank you. Any questions? I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, do we have any online public comment on this? issue and I don't see any in house so let me hear a motion I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes for November 22nd 2022 as presented second All right we have a motion on the floor to approve the November 22 um, 2022 meeting minutes as presented the motion was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes I'm assuming there's nothing to it we'll just go right to a vote And that motion passes five to zero. We're coming to the end of the line, commissioners. <laughs> We're making progress. Um, City Clerk, do we have any general online comment? We do have one in house. Mr. Willis, if you would come forward. Justin Willis, Northport resident. Hello again. Uh, Florida State Statute 166.0425 covers municipalities in sign ordinances. It says that nothing in Chapter 78-8, laws of Florida shall, demand, shall be deemed to supersede the rights and powers of municipalities and counties to establish sign ordinances. However, such ordinance shall not conflict with any applicable state and federal law. On September 12, 2022, a memo was sent from the city clerk to commission stating beginning September 12th, 2022, all signs in the right of way will be removed and placed on the side of City Hall. 
Every Monday morning, the signs collected will be disposed of. This includes business signs, political signs, and any other signs that are not placed in the proper areas. If the sign was not, not installed by the city, it will be collected. It also says in here that there will be no notification to the city clerk or to the sign, or, or sign owner prior or to, to prior to or after its removal. Again, that goes against our code. Um, October on October fourteenth, um, and by the way, I know that didn't come from city clerk; that was directed from somewhere else. Um, so on October fourteenth, city manager signed emergency order twenty twenty two dash eight that states allowing temporary signage for businesses whose signage has been destroyed or damaged by the Hurricane Ian will aid in communicating the availability of goods and services, thereby benefiting the local economy and the public who may need the goods and services. And whereas this order is necessary for emergency management purposes to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Again, this is creating a new conflict within the code itself. Um, in the Supreme Court decision um, by Judge Thomas, it states that the town had offered two jurisdictions for its laws, aesthetics and traffic safety. Thomas assumed that the ordinance furthered these compelling government interests, but said, of the ordinance, said that the ordinance was hopelessly under-inclusive because all types of signs can cause visual clutter and impact traffic safety. The town has offered no reason to believe that the directional signs pose a greater threat to safety than the, than that of an ideological or political sign, Thomas wrote. If anything, a sharply worded ideological sign may seem more likely to distract a driver than a sign directing the public to a nearby church or event. Um, with that, again, I ask you, how can a single staff member with no legal background interpret Supreme Court ruling without having that checked by legal? I am asking the commission to correct this overreach of staff to accept my permit, which was submitted to the commission by email. I also have a paper copy of it here. And I'm also asking you to ask staff to follow the current code, go back to accepting the special event permits as the code directs, or to suspend collections of the signs until February 14th meeting. And I also ask that you make that at time specific to 6 p.m., not 10 a.m. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of us would want to make a decision on this item tonight, but it was not on the agenda and has not. Audio. Audio again, I'm sure there are several of us that, that might want to take action on this item tonight, um, but it was not on the agenda and the item was not officially noticed. So we won't be doing that tonight. Um, I did mention earlier that this item will be on the agenda. I believe it is our February 14th meeting that was confirmed by city manager. Um, and uh, we'll have to leave it at that for tonight. Um, okay. So, Commissioner Communications, Commissioner Emmerich. Um, yeah, I had uh, attended the annual State of the City Address last week uh, with the Chamber and City Manager. Very good meeting. Um, it was very informative. Steak was excellent. Um, had my MPO joint Sarasota Manatee meeting with Charlotte County MPO yesterday. And that was to uh, talk about major, major concerns is the I-75 interchange between here and Kings Highway. And we will have more meetings over the next few years on getting that in place with uh, DOT coming down and giving recommendations and possible what, what roads will be taken care of by them in exchange for where that, that interchange is going to go with. With that, those are the only two things outside the dais that I have attended over the last few weeks. Thank you, Commissioner Vice Mayor. Yes, I wanted to first share an email that I received from a very satisfied um, resident out there. Um, he's been having some swale issues in front of his property and he wrote to me that he met with Mike and Lewis of the Public Works Department. He enjoyed the conversation. He was very pleased that someone was listening and hopefully the issue will be resolved. And I found out that's Mike Vork, I think the last name is, and Louis Chapez Lupo were the two employees. So um, I know they're, they're not listening now, <laughs> I'm sure. 
<laughs> but um, I, I think it's it's uh, always worth noting when somebody is doing something really good, and and to 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 know that um, residents like this, I was really glad that he did uh, tell me when something good is happening. Um, I did attend after the your MPO meetings because I know you were, were there um, in Venice. I attended the Florida Gulf Coast Trail meeting that was held right after that. Um, and that is, one of the directors is Charles Hines, who is a former Sarasota County Commissioner. And I remember contacting him last year about the Florida Gulf Coast Trail, which is going to be a 336 mile long corridor traversing seven counties from Hillsborough down to Collier County. It's, it's bike, it's uh, bicycles, walking, and initially, it was not going to come into Northport. I remember when this was coming up a couple of years ago. Now it is. Um, and it's coming via the connector that we just had um, put in. And it will take them down. The plan is to go down. Is that the R36 ditch that's called? It runs yes. alongside. OK, thank you. Um, and that path down to 41, because then it goes 41 into Port Charlotte. But it can also go. Uh, north into the Welland Park, and it goes over into the Englewood area and El Jobine. It's just tremendous, and I was really, really happy that um, we're on that path now. And uh, this is put out by the um, it's the Trust for Public Land is uh, is the nonprofit group that's coordinating this this whole thing. So. Um, that's really good news, and I was excited about that, and also to see a lot of people that I knew there, um, because there are people like who work on the fun things, like Parks and Rec, and and uh, working with trails. Um, also, the uh, I think it was last week that uh, on ABC News, yes, I happened to have the TV on uh, at seven o'clock, and ABC Channel Seven had um, something about our clothes. Uh, clothing closet. Um, so I thought that was kind of neat to see something about Northport that wasn't was, was something good. So I really was happy to see that. I did the John Rawlings show last week. We had a great conversation. I hadn't been on his show for quite some time, so it was good to get back in into that. Uh, this week I'm meeting with the Girl Scouts in the library. They're working on their democracy badge. So I am going to meet with them um, at the Northport Library, I think it is, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I was a Girl Scout myself, and I was a brownie leader also. Uh, when I was going to school to be a teacher, I was advised, you know, if you really want to work with children, you really have to know first if you want to work with children. So <laughs> it was good advice. I became a brownie leader, uh, and that was a lot of fun. I went to teen court. Was that last night? Yes. Um, that was held right here. And that was a great experience. It's, it's a wonderful program. And uh, I was so impressed with all of the youngsters that were here that took it very, very seriously. I also realized that they lear learned the decorum of being in, in a setting like this and how to act and, and follow direction. And I thought that was really good. And yes, the city manager's daughter was, they take turns, right? First the prosecutor and then they're the defense attorney. Um, and they, they take it so seriously, and they were so professional, and I was just so impressed. Because I, I think when, I know when I was that age, I never could have been, done something like that. Um, so they were so poised, and I was really impressed. Sunday, I went to the Northport Concert Band, uh, because they did an award goes to. They were playing music from, um, uh, that had won Academy Awards. I love um old movies and, and songs from, from that. I think we all went to the, did we all go to the, um, the, the uh, sit, state of the city? Did we all go to that? Yeah, right? So that was, that was great. And then also, um, just so people would know that uh, Butler Park, we're hosting the Embracing Our Differences display starting March 22nd. I'm really excited for that. It says it's the 20th anniversary. Uh, I remember when I went to the very first one. Uh, that's such a tremendous display. And we had it at Northport High School uh, some years many ago. many years. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really happy to see it come back into Northport. And it's, it's great. So it's from March 22nd through April 19th. So I'm really also happy it's going to be here for a while. Of course, we had the dedication for the fire rescue tower. Right? We haven't met since then, have we? 
remember. Um, I don't think we talked about that. Um, and that was that was a great thing as well. It has the big number 63 on it. Why is that number 63 on there? As <laughs> I learned that 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 the fire uh, personnel they when they get their badge that's that's the number of employ like their number in order. Do I have that right? All right. And uh, our fire chief Titus, he so that you were the 63rd em fire employee hired. Is that what that means? Um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> But that's why the number 63 is on the tower, if anybody wants to know why, what, what does that number have to do with anything? So that's it. That's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Commissioner, my brain is melting. Stokes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> over the last month, I, uh, I completed tours with the police and fire departments, so I do want to thank Chief Titus. And Garrison and uh, Vice Chief Morales for taking their time. Um, makes me proud to see what we do and how we do it. You guys are our shining stars, so I thank you. Also, uh, as Commissioner White said, Vice Mayor, uh, we attended the um, ribbon cutting for the for the new fire rescue tower. Um, long time in coming, and uh, I know. Uh, Everybody is proud that we have this wonderful facility for our folks to train on. Uh, I also attended the uh, monthly homeless to home get together by nonprofits, which I try to do every month. Uh, they do great work and um, kudos to them for all they do. Uh, also attended last week, uh, Friday and Saturday, the Florida League of Cities newly elected officials uh, up in St. Augustine. Um, that was a, a great opportunity for me to learn a whole lot about, uh, you know, parliamentary procedure, budgeting, revenues, um, some things I knew, some things I didn't, get a chance to network with some of the folks who, uh, you know, who are, are uh, out there around the state also sitting on commissions. Um, so I did miss the state of the city address, but I took the time to listen online and uh, you made us proud, city manager. Thank you for helping us and carrying us and leading us through this past year, which was a challenge for everybody. And that is it for me. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McDowell. Boy, I, I understand now what it feels like to go last. Usually I go first. I feel like a, it's a, a repeat. <laughs> um, attended the Homeless to Home Luncheon. Absolutely love that luncheon and everything it represents and stands for. It's, it's an amazing group of people. Um, State of the City Address uh, and Chamber Luncheon, uh, where we recognize Gail West as the Business Advocate of the Year. Kudos to her. Kudos to city manager, you did a fantastic job with your state of the city address. Um, I also went to the MPO to see the joint meeting with Sarasota County and Charlotte County officials where they talked about things that impact us. We're South Sarasota and, and North of Charlotte. So um, it, quite informative. I had only wished I knew about the trails meeting afterwards, but I had already scheduled other meetings. Um, I also uh, attended the Sarasota County delegation meeting. Um, Mayor Langdon, you did a fantastic job presenting, especially the priority for um, affordable housing. Um, you did a really good job. Thank you for that. Uh, stuck around to see former Commissioner Luke and her presentation about Warm Middle Springs and Little Salt Springs to be a outstanding spring um, de designation with the state. Um, I don't know if you guys, oh, I also attended the Convocation of Government with Sarasota County School Board. Great job. I, I enjoy that, the networking and hearing all the different things that are happening with the schools. Well, in Park School coming online probably next year. Um, that to me is phenomenal because I haven't even broken ground yet. <laughs> you know, and it's going to be done in like a year. But look at how fast the Brave Stadium went up. So I can see why it would happen. Um, I am 
proud to say that I am in Leadership Northport, class of 2023. I had my first class last week. Last week? Was it two weeks ago? My gosh. Um, it, it was very enjoyable to learn our different leadership styles. And it is no surprise that I am very consistent with these kind of uh, programs where you kind of see what your leadership style is. I'm a fact-finding kind of gal. <laughs> I don't think it's going to change because every one of those tests I take, it stays the same. Um, I do have a couple of requests or want to share with you. Um, after Hurricane Irma, the county did an after-action symposium, for lack of another term, where we kind of learned what they did really, really good, what they did eh, not so good, we need to fix some of these things, and how they were going to fix these things. And I don't know if city manager has heard when the county is going to be holding that after action. Maybe symposium is not the right word. I don't know. Um, if the county is going to have it and when it's going to be held. And since the city of Northport was impacted, I will safe to say far greater than the entire county. I'm wondering if the city of Northport is going to be holding some kind of an after action um, dialogue, maybe, maybe at a workshop or at a commission meeting where we can hear some of the really great things, which we know <coughs> the great things, hear some of the constraints and, and learn from them so that they don't get repeated um, and everything in between and then be able to give commission feedback, citizen feedback. Um, I know a lot of citizens are still grappling with the never ending red tape of FEMA and, and their insurance companies and everything in between. Um, but that is beyond our control. But a, a, a city focused SWOT analysis I think might be warranted. And I don't know if the city manager has given that a consideration. Um, I'm sure he has. <laughs> But I, I really feel if they are going to do that, that the commission needs to be a part of that because we have to plan for these upcoming budget cycles. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the radar, see if that's something city manager might be interested <coughs> in looking at. If he needs consensus from the board to do something like that, then so be it. We can do that very easily tonight. Um, so I just kind of... Feedback from my fellow commissioner, city manager. So we are actually in the process of doing the action after action report with the county. I'm pretty sure after we have our meeting with the county, we'll know what and if the county wants to participate in for one with anything sort of on a deeper dive with Northport. And then two, with our long term resiliency work group that is being led by the uh, external group, the Olson group. There is stakeholder engagement processes coming down the pipeline, which includes commissioners, citizens, and everyone else who was involved and need to have information. So it'll all be bundled up in that package of information with opportunities for everyone to participate. Thank you. Look yes, forward to those future meetings. And my last one, we while we can't make any decisions or conversations about the multiple public commenters about signs, I wanted to remind the city manager, if he is not aware, that he does have the authority to allow a flyer for this event to be placed in the Morgan and Mullen Center, if that's something he feels would be beneficial to the event that's going to bring hundreds of people from across the area to this winter fest. It is a very well attended event and it brings people not only to the event, but to the city as a whole. So I hope that either the city manager would consider approving something like that if he needs the request of the parties that are hosting the event, then that's fine. But I just wanted to throw it out there to see if maybe that might be an avenue to help get the word out about the event. So with that, Mayor, I am completely finished. And I thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I also go to the MPO along with Commis <clears throat> Commissioner Emmerich, um, so I won't reiterate what he said, but, but one of the talking points of that meeting 
was that the MPO is looking at the entire stretch of 75 and all of the interchanges off 75 um, as being areas that they're going to be looking at and um, evaluating how we can improve you know, traffic flow and emergency flow through those. Uh, I did bring up the fact that 75 flooded along with um, the exit on Sumter and requested that they make that interchange a priority given the magnitude of the impact of that. And I was very happy to see in a later presentation that the Sumter exit off 75 was indeed um, uh, called out for uh, priority work. So I was very pleased to, to see that. Um, I also popped into the clothing closet pop-up event on Saturday morning and um, was very pleased to see the level of activity. There were a lot of people getting clothes. Um, there were some um, folks expected to come to really bring a lot of those clothes and send them over to Ukraine. Uh, and I was sad to hear that that might be their last pop-up event. So um, I, I sort of, I'm sure I'll be talking with city manager <laughs> about this after this meeting. Um, because if parties are willing, I'd like to see if we can continue to incorporate some of those pop-up events in our activities. I also saw the little spot on TV about the closet, clothing closet, and I'm always so pleased when I see positive information about the city shared on the media. Um, however, I must say I was a little disappointed that the spot did not mention that the clothing closet is a city event that is managed um, in conjunction or in partnership with Kiwanis. So that did disappoint me. Um, let me see. Yeah, I did. I was honored to represent the city at the county legislative delegation meetings, but um, the statement I gave was really a team effort, and I did the least amount of work on that statement. And so I just really want to thank staff for providing me with great talking points and um, supporting some last minute back and forth to make the statement a little bit more effective. I also participated in an incubate. Um, a meeting to discuss bringing or developing or building an incubator, a business incubator here in Northport. I was sort of the instigator behind that meeting, motivated by the destruction of the hive. And although the hive wasn't classically an incubator, it was a very effective co-work facility, and it's a serious loss to our city. So losing um, the hive and then hearing at um, a, a meeting here that there could be federal monies available to um, municipalities that had experienced disaster to build an incubator, I thought it would be a good idea to get some folks together and talk about that. So city staff was there, city manager was there. We had representatives of Minnesota SCORE, Charlotte County SCORE, the SBDC out of Fort Myers. Um, we had uh, a gentleman who was well entrenched in a venture capital group um, in the Port Charlotte area. I'm meeting one of these Fridays to have lunch with a friend of mine who's very connected to venture capitalists in the North County area, because one of the big work items will be money, of course. Um, how do we fund something like this? But I was very optimistic. There was a lot of energy in the room, a lot of support in the room. Um, collectively, the group thought that Northport is the perfect location to to provide this kind of facility that it could be a great regional asset. 
So given the hour, that's it for me. I've done some other things, but my fellow commissioners have mentioned them. So I'm going to zip. You Can I follow up on something you sure. mentioned? Sure. Um, the incubator mm -hmm. um, program. I remember the first time that I had heard you speak about that mm -hmm. was when we were here for the Economic Development Forum where we had all of the state agencies here. Mm -hmm. And I remember that they said if you have a program that is of a regional impact and, and has not just transportation or economic development or, or anything like that to bring it forward to them, has any, any projects been brought forward or discussed as a result of that wonderful, very informative meeting that we had on economic development before the holidays, shortly after Hurricane this is, Ian. That was the purpose of this meeting, was to pull together the group, um, because it was very clear that um, in order to get the federal funding, we needed to demonstrate <clears throat> regional impact and have significant support in the community and in the surrounding mm -hmm. communities. So I think we, we pulled together the right people, I suspect, we may add folks um, as we move forward with the different work groups, but uh, I'm very excited about the potential of that. And, you know, there was a, a lot of really um, serious interest in working to bring such a facility here to the city. So very excited about that. City Manager, do you have anything to share this evening? Uh Briefly, Madam Mayor, I was just going to say when you made the comment about the pop-up tents, uh, oh, excuse me, pop-up events uh, for the one you went to this past weekend, um, those can continue. The organization would just put in like a, a permit for that same use in that same space and they would do it. Now, during the same time that you were there this weekend, it'll be open in our new uh, location at the Family Service Center, but that doesn't exclude them or preclude them from doing that there. I think it depends on their inventory and their sort of um, staffing levels, but we will be meeting internally to debrief on how uh, we have now opened up our services at the Family Service Center and then how we can be the best partner and create that relationship uh, with that particular organization going forward, which is important to all of us. Okay. That's great. I'm glad to hear there is the potential of more pop-ups. I had understood that this might be their last, so that's great news. I can, I can imagine if, because they're still collecting donations of their own. Right. So, you know, and we're collecting, you know, we have our own inventory. I'd imagine as their inventory gets to a level where they need to sort of have it, they'll have it. But I won't speak on their behalf. I'm right. just saying right. what I believe. But we don't stop them from doing their pop up events, they, they would just go through, go the, through per the permitting process. Okay, that sounds great. Question? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm very confused because I didn't know about a pop up event. What was the pop up event you and the city manager are talking about? So um, when we when we collect materials for the clothing closet, um, we sort of have two pieces to it. We we, there's some material that doesn't meet the criteria that staff has set for the closet that's now on Pan American, but there is still a lot of value to that material. And, and one of the things that Kiwanis has traditionally done with the materials they collect for the closet is those things that are surplus, however that's defined, are given to other organizations, like homeless organizations, um, made available for Ukrainian relief or, or other kinds of things. And um, since the new clothing closet has opened, uh, Kiwanis has done, I don't know, a couple of pop-up events uh, by the old clothing closet to get rid of that surplus material. I hope I'm describing that accurately. Well, and they had a pop-up event on January the 7th, and then they had one. One on Saturday. Yes, right. but when, if you think about back to the relationship that we had, we got the modular for the partnership with them because we wanted to get out of the building. Right. And that, right. that was one version of the partnership. And then the modular got damaged beyond repair, so then we moved it to our inside facility 
at the Family Service Center, which created another model of partnership. Mm -hmm. right. So we're trying to work through the different iterations of reinventing it and keeping some things the same while changing other things for the better. And that's how we're trying to merge the two. So now that they've had that pop up, and I won't say that that's their last pop up, but their, their, their most recent pop up, and we've had the Family Service Center open, now it's time to say, okay, where do we combine the two and how do we make it the best for both organizations? Right, right. And I think that the thing I'm excited about is that um, with the partnership between Kiwanis and the city, people now have access to the closet six days a week. Right, more. More, um, way more right, than, right. Um, you know, Kiwanis traditionally, and I hope will continue to do Thursday nights and Saturday mornings. Um, I appreciate that feedback and that additional mm -hmm. information because this is all news to me. Yeah. So why didn't we just get a new modular unit for the clothing closet instead of moving it all the way over to social services? There was a rented modular unit. I'm sure they could have brought a new one in for us. It was not rented. And two, there was a shortage so was it on rented? it was not rented. It was short there was a shortage on modulars and we needed to get the closet open so that we could not have it be out of service. It was out of service for quite some time. Right, and then right. when you look at what happened over at the um, Dallas White complex, there came a point where the roof mm. in reality or not of the Al Ball Center appeared to be repaired. And it just we had a conversation with staff. It just on its face, it looked like we weren't trying to open the closet. And that wasn't the case. But if I were someone looking at it, I'd say, well, why aren't you fixing the other building? And then you start talking about okay. the issues with the buildings and having to explain why you didn't want to do it. So we tried to make it a sense of urgency to get a space filled. And Chuck Speak, who is no longer here, if Janet Carrillo was here, our, um, our manager would tell you he did a great job with the staff there of getting the new place fit so that we could have a space mm -hmm. in her own building. I believe she gave up part of her lobby, if right. I'm not mistaken, right. yeah. in order to retrofit it out for the closet and the new clothes that and items that she has. She got, I believe she said 18 pallets of clothing donated from Walmart mm -hmm. um, in order to provide her or kick off her inventory. Right. So she has a great set of quality products for her to distribute to the public. Um, the Kiwanis would have another set of uh, items that they may want to give out to the public. But the goal there and the, the, the true issue is just to make sure that we can have a better experience for the community as we service them in these ways. And where the city has its borders and boundaries based on regulations related to um, yeah, how we so. operate as a government, when we hit those, we want to pass them off to uh, the Qantas because we know that they are a little bit more flexible in what they can do and how they can do it. And then you serve both demographics at the same time while just having more hours and more availability. But there, it has been a challenge to get to where we are. Right. And priority number right. one has been to open the closet. And that's what we've done. And based on this pop-up that this was this past weekend, now we just need to come together and figure out how do we make it work together. Right, right. And I'm I'm sort of assuming that <coughs> the location at social services, I would expect we might develop a long-term strategy well, at some point that this is sort of an emergency interim so we, solution. Yes, ma'am. So we had that conversation. So we didn't want to... <coughs> the Dallas White building, which was falling down, was one. Then we went to a temporary location, which that temporary location got damaged by... The storm and to make uh, Commissioner McDowell's question, we didn't want to put a temporary temp situation on another temporary situation. So we said, you know what, let's just put it there. We'll see how it works. If we get through the process and we get feedback and that's not the right location and that's not the permanent place for it to be, then we can pivot and do something else. But the closet has to be open. Whatever we do is, I don't want to say just like Warmingle Springs, but just like Warmingle Springs, it needs to be open in order for it to have the best impact on us. So we just all have to be sort of flexible in, in envisioning what does the new normal look like for it. Yeah. And, and it, forgive me, this is all new to me. I, mm -hmm. I did not hear anything about this. It wasn't communicated to me. I didn't know anything about it. So I, forgive me for my questions, but I'm grateful I'm learning this whole new system. Um, it sounds like we no longer have that agreement in place that we had with Kiwanis 
that Qantas is doing these pop-ups now and the city is handling the clothing closet without Qantas? No, is that what no, I'm hearing? Qantas is yes, still yes, doing. <coughs> yes. As a board member for Qantas, that's exactly what you understand. Ma mayor. Mayor. Yeah, let's, but no, no comments. Uh, you'll have to leave if you keep an interrupting the meeting, Mr. Yeah. Willis. So. so back to you. The question was, is it a different agreement? So the agreement that we had with the modular was an agreement with the modular. Right. The staff is working on a different agreement that will come before this commission as they mold into what the agreement will be at the Family Service Center. So you go from one agreement at one location to another agreement at another location. The point of contact who we have been working with at Kiwanis is well aware of what we're doing. She and her, she and her volunteer staff are well aware of what their hours would be. There's a, there's a, um, the, the Kiwanis has run the program for 30 years. So there is an ingrained group of volunteers who right. would like to run it on their six to nine on Thursdays and uh, eight to 12 on Saturdays. We are fully aware of that. So there's, Mayor, maybe I appreciate this conversation. What I'll do is I'll take it offline I think with the city manager yeah. and, and get with him to get a better understanding just, because I thought there was another agreement with Qantas and the partnership for well, the clothing there's, closet. There's so. no different agreement. <laughs> okay. And, and this is implementation. So, yeah, this uh, is just the, new to me. And the it's appropriate surprise. way to communicate what's going on is, is through these reports. And <laughs> that's why I'm reporting on it because. I'm sure that no clue many about of us, you know, weren't aware of what was going on, nor should we necessarily have been aware of what was going on. Well, I've been okay, sending people so, to the clothing closet on Sam Sharpos. I didn't know it wasn't even. <laughs> so thank you. So anything else from you, City Manager? No, ma'am, but. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, I thought you had, you asked for a tour of the new yeah, facility based on the email that I, sent out. No, I saw it on social media. Mm -hmm. well, on social that's media, when right. I went, what? <laughs> so I didn't know anything about it prior to that. So I appreciate the conversation. I didn't know anything about a pop-up. I didn't know that this was being done separately, kind of together. I don't know. Uh, I'll learn more when I take my tour on Wednesday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Sounds Wednesday. Good. Anything else, City Manager? No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. City Attorney? Yes, ma'am. I was so glad, Vice Mayor White, to hear that you observed Teen Court recently. Assistant City Attorney Caitlin Coughlin volunteers with Teen Court, and she serves as the judge here, Sam, and in Venice, Sam, and she was previously involved in the Pinellas County's Teen Court organization. So I just want to say how proud we are of how well she represents the, the city um, in her personal community involvement. And Vice Mayor, I just want to reach out to you because I also am on the hook for that Girl Scout meeting. And oh. I, did, I did reach out to Megan and suggested that rather than having that meeting at the library, that they have it here. Commissioner McDowell did oh. a similar kind of tour and the kids got to sit up here and we talked about government and it was really pretty <laughs> terrific. So. I would love to team up with you. I haven't heard back from Megan yet, but I'm hoping okay. they'll take us up on our offer to have their meeting here. Okay. I think it would be terrific. We'd have fun doing it yeah, together. Sure. City Clerk, anything from you? Well, I'm really impressed. I was considering bringing my sleeping bag tonight when I saw this agenda, so oh, I just want to compliment you. I lost staff the over under. <laughs> and my fellow commissioners for really staying on point given an extremely robust agenda. So thank you very much. And since we have concluded our meeting, it is 9.52, and this meeting um, is adjourned. Nice. We do our very best to make sure that these do not get disturbed. By doing so, we walk vacant lots when land clear permits get issued to ensure that there are not any burns.